thing that but now it's rare for me to meet a family that doesn't have somebody who's a stand-up comedian in it or a wannabe stand-up comedian or somebody who's working in comedy Hello and welcome to the Ask the Industry podcast, episode 121. I'm comedian Simon Kane, and for those of you new to the show, this is the podcast where I interview the most influential people from the worlds of stand-up, comedy, radio, and today, TV production. Although that really undersells this week's guest as we cover everything. Griff Rhys Jones is a Welsh comedian, writer, actor, and TV presenter. In this rare, lengthy, and in-depth interview, we get into his origins in the industry, how he made award winning but not profitable radio adverts which led him into TV and now in his retirement how he's taken up stand-up and is trying to build himself a live audience. I adored this and I got loads out of it. I think most people who have watched TV in the UK for the last, I don't know, 20 or 30 years will have come across his work with Talkback and just everything together really sort of bundled this episode into something that I learned loads about and I don't even want to talk about it too much, I just want to get into it because this is a mega episode, he told me that he hasn't really done a podcast before and if he's honest he's never done one of this length before, we're actually only meant to meet for about 40-45 minutes and we ended up chatting for about, I don't know, 3-4 hours, I've edited it down to I think about 2 hours or so just because we went over the same ground a couple of times and we were just having a bit of fun chatting about the circuit and different areas of things that didn't really feel appropriate to keep in the podcast so uh, i hope you get a lot out of this and i hope you really enjoy it because it was so much fun to talk to him and i i really loved it we both completely lost track of time so uh let's jump into it before before we jump into it actually uh just a, a subtle reminder that i'm doing the edinburgh fringe festival with uh, my fourth hour called every room becomes a panic room when you overthink enough it's 8 35 p.m it's in the grass market it's at sweet venues and it is five pounds a ticket and there is a link in the show notes. I think I remembered everything there. I didn't write that down. I just put a note in my in my script that just said, plug your Edinburgh show. Probably should have uh, checked that. But there is, there's a link in the show notes. If you're going to Edinburgh, please come. If you're not going to Edinburgh, please tell someone who is. Or come see me on tour. I'm on tour. I'm always on tour. <laughs> if you're new here, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button. If you're old here, please do remember to give us an honest, ideally positive review in iTunes. And either way, please do join the Facebook group. It's called Ask the Industry Podcast and it's on Facebook, obviously. It's the best place to ask your questions to future guests to get the answers you need. But for now, this is Griff Rhys Jones. But you realise that I am basically retired, so nothing I can say <laughs> applies. Well, I mean, you've got a wealth of information. I don't. I I've got a wealth of experience, but the experience I have is all out of date. I wouldn't say that. Oh, no, not from. I mean, your agent told me that you're going back to Australia to tour in a couple of days' time or something. So, oh, I'm doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, but this is basically, this is called the business, because it's about the interstices of the business, is it? It's called, it's called Ask the Industry, and right. and the idea of it is to ask the industry what they do and how oh, they do I it, and, and how, basically what you see happening within the industry from your point of view. Okay, I have to say this, again, yeah. I've always prided myself on not being part of the industry, okay. I don't like the term, right, sort of side of it, although I've been quite successful at it, but I don't, you know... I don't, and I don't like the idea of people building careers or things like that. It should be something you do casually. See, I, I mm. believe that, and I like that as a mm. thing, which is why I do things I just enjoy. Sorry, but, but should, do you want to start formally? And then I, now I know. Well, no, I'm sorry, I've started yeah. off with something which is de- deliberately no, provocative. Um, no, that's, just to because, be fair, that's, that's in question four, so that's, that's pretty right. much what I want to just talk because, about. Talk back, but, so. but that's because I just, that's, but that's probably born. So start, start. Start and well, we'll come to that. And do you have a lot of listeners who you think are sort of wannabe comedians, one kind or another? Uh, I so my listenership because actually we had like a big meet up in Edinburgh and stuff like that. So I'm a, I'm acutely aware of my listenership. Mm. I would say eighty eighty five percent of the listeners are some type of comedy in that area. So I'm yes. a performer, a writer, a producer, I, that sort of thing. And right. then the other 15% uh, are either comedy fanatics mm-hmm. or just really hardcore fans who kind of just want to know more about how I this see. thing got made. How it does, yeah. how it happens. Yeah, okay. yeah. So that's that. Mm. So that's they're, they're the people you're talking to at the moment. All right. Um, yeah. Although intermittently I get emails from uh, musicians and magicians who have found oh, some right. sort of transferable information All from right. it. Okay. The original reason I spoke to your agent about this was talkback, was to discuss your relationship with TV and and why you started a company. Oh yeah, I can explain shows. that. I can explain all that. Um, but also, I can't take responsibility of talking detail. 
about various programs. Oh, of course. Some, some people, I was in Australia and I got interviewed by a guy who wanted to talk in detail about uh, about um, uh, Steve Coogan and people like that. And there, there are two reasons for, for oh, the, you know, that was complicated. I didn't want to sort of, you know, no. I didn't want to assume. Anyway, never mind. You I understand how complicated that is. Okay, but we'll, we'll get to them. Yeah. We'll talk to them. And I've explained absolutely cogently as the best I can what it is that, that where I am and what I know. Sure. Well, my, my, my take on interviewing is, uh, first of all, it's, it's all about you. I try, I edit myself largely right. out of this. And secondly, I'm not here to kind of sort of, it's not like a gossipy okay. thing. I should shut up. Is there anything else <laughs> you need to explain to me? Not at all. Can? All right. Okay. okay. Well, off you go then. Well, I tell you what. Why don't, why don't we? I wanted to start right back yes. to when you when you were starting out in in comedy and, yes. and in performing, and I just wondered when you started, what your aims were, and what what you thought was the first step to achieving that aim. <laughs> um. <laughs> but I feel like that, not... this is the definition of what the difference was. Probably yeah. in um, in nineteen seventy thereabouts. Okay, mm-hmm. so we're at school and we're like um, Monty Python, and so um, I remember watching Monty Python late at night with my father, and the two of us laughing about it. And I remember most of my school. I went to a quite a high pressure school, and uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, homework to do, a lot of work. So a lot of my early life. I mean, I loved funny things, but a lot of my early life was actually teenage life was spent upstairs trying wrestling with maths which i didn't want to do listening to my father <laughs> laughing downstairs at comedies that i couldn't get down to see but i was always uh, uh, so i'm a sort of 60s comedy person brought up on loving people like frankie howard and uh, a loving dad's army and loving uh, and uh, radio two uh, sitting and listening um to uh, uh radio two comedy uh, as we had Sunday lunch. That meant that you listened to the Ken Dodd show. Uh, you listened to... I'm just trying to think of some of the other shows. They were around the horn. Uh, and there was always a sort of Sunday lunchtime fantastic... Um, and what was the name? What was that? I'm just trying to remember. There was a there was a sort of little... Oh, it'll come to me. Anyway, so all these things had sort of ingrained themselves, more common wise and so forth. So the idea around that... what, what Around the, the, the end of that period... Suddenly, into the into the mix, um, came Peter Cook and Dudley Moore and um, uh, Monty Python. And Monty Python was the first comedy that said to sixth formers, uh, "We are for you." I mean, sixth formers had loved the Goon Show and, mm. and uh, laid awake at night. But that was funny enough. That was just a generation before me. I was too little to really sort of be somebody who... That was sort of a Prince Charles generation to sort of be addicted. So I think we knew all about the Gucci, mm. but we didn't... We didn't... Uh, we didn't sort of... We weren't... But we, came before, we became fanatical about Monty Python. Uh, and I was certainly was not as fanatical as some people were fanatical about Monty Python. People who could quote whole sketches at you over the breakfast table or um, uh, on, on your way to play football or on the bus home and all that stuff. That was, that became, that was really important. And I remember that it was quite a distinction and, and one of the things that ticks for my father that I was able to sit with him and laugh at it whereas my mother just found it confusing so that was really big yeah and quite bonding for you yeah. too as well. but there was no sense at that stage that uh, uh, you were there was a comedy career or there were other people earning a living Making comedians were a sort of separate bunch of people who were, who were people you laughed at but there was no sort of sense of, gosh, it's a sort of thing that people do. Although everybody knew, especially at my end of the end of the spectrum, which was direct grant school, not public school, not private school. Um, uh, and uh, everybody knew that the people who'd gone to, to Cambridge um, had become David Frost. They didn't, did, they didn't really know anything, anybody else who'd gone to Cambridge. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there was no other there was no other sense for the for the big wide world of what people who went to university did right. uh, after they'd been to university obviously they became doctors we didn't even know they became lawyers we didn't know any lawyers but i came from a medical family so we didn't you know there was no sense yeah. of going oh you know you go to university and you will become a lawyer or a top businessman or something like that there was a sort of there was a you became a teacher or something like that or be, be kept, you might become as far as my mother was concerned david frost because that was the sort of what yeah. bright and, and sort of clever people like jonathan miller had done yeah 
So that was, I suppose, in the back of my mind. But and I had done a lot of theatre at school, but not so very successfully. Not I was always playing. I was the sort of person who played O'Mull and uh, you know uh, uh, Horatio. Uh, no, I think I played a witch in Macbeth. And as I got older, I was not cast in anything anyway. So you know, so I hadn't done. But I was. I used to share a dressing room, sitting in a classroom, uh, playing around with makeup with Douglas Adams. And Douglas was much more interested in comedy. And they did a couple of things at school, which were uh, parodies of the Magic Roundabout. And we used to do that. We used to have an arts thing at school, which we did in the sixth form uh, some nights. Um, and Douglas, I remember quite distinctly, was already uh, writing um, funny parodies and sketches and things like that. So I go to university. I've already decided that um, I'm not really going to do a lot of acting. That's not something I can do. Uh, uh, because I'm not very, not, I'm not going to say very good at it, but I'd, I thought I was good at it, but I wasn't being very successful at school. Can I, can I ask, do you think that was like a, a, a youth imposter syndrome element of it, or do you, or do you think, looking back, you're, you're, you're quite aware of your limitations in that? Oh, no, I was always, I was always very, uh, uh, I was always, always very self-assured, if you see what I mean. Okay. Uh, so whatever, I mean, wh- when I say self-assured, um, uh, as neurotic as anybody else, but what I mean by that was uh, <laughs> was the sort of sense of uh, of I don't know how can I put this e- egomaniacal was right. always part of the whole thing, and so was Douglas. Mm. Uh, and Douglas had gone ahead, and so uh, I, w- I wasn't even very close to Douglas, you know. But I knew Douglas well enough. Mm. So I arrive in my college, and I go to uh, I'm given a pigeonhole, and I go to the pigeonhole, and it's full of junk. Did you go to university? Did you I go did, to, yeah. Did you go to uh, anything like the college system? No. Well, that's all changed. You see, yeah. in those days, you literally had a thing in your uh, in the in the. Uh, in you never the, had a pigeonhole. Yeah, you had a pigeonhole, no. and in that, that was stuffed every form of invitation to join the yeah. Theosophical Club, and you know. Oh, you didn't have like a fair that you went to, and, and there was a fair and all oh, that okay, stuff. Fine, and people fine, talk fine. about that as well. Yeah. And I probably went to the fair with some people I met yeah. and everything. But although I don't specifically remember that, <laughs> you know, other people talk to me about me having turned up at that fair, but I don't remember <laughs> it. I, I went to the fair later. Yeah. But the truth is that Douglas Adams sent. Is this squeaking too much, this chair? It's fine. All right. Yeah. Douglas Adams sent it, me a it, note. It doesn't pick up much background okay. stuff as long as because direction also it's fine. So I go to the pigeonhole, and Douglas Adams has sent me a note. And he said, do you want to be in a play? And I uh, thought, uh, oh, that sounds fun. I, I mean, how great. You know, in other words, this is not Mr. Barron, whoever it is, making his decisions anymore. This is Douglas, my mate, making his decisions about mm. whether I could be an actor or not. So I went along. And um, the uh, play was The Rivals. And they needed somebody to play fag because they don't, nobody goes into these sort of things. But I imagine somebody had been told, sent down or told not to do any more theatre or something like that. And uh, the people involved in Cambridge theatre did a lot of diff- lot of things in those days. You know, five or six productions a, uh, a term, you know, it was not unusual. No, five or six, three or four anyway. So uh, anyway, this is like the first thing. I've arrived in Cambridge. I haven't even met a tutor or anything and somebody's saying come along to a rehearsal and play so i go along do an audition to play fag in the rivals and uh, uh this is all with uh, all senior people then i go and see my tutor and the tutor says uh have you have any interests and so i said oh yeah I'm, well i'm quite interested in theater and he sighed and he looked he looked aghast and said, well, be careful, you know, um, it can take up a lot of people's time. And uh, he said, uh, if I were you, you know, maybe do a college production this year and sometime, you know, next year, go to the ADC. And I said, oh, no, no, I'm already in an ADC big theatre production. And he looked dismay. <laughs> and that was, uh, but Douglas was heavily involved with all the people who were then running Footlights. So I met, I was all right in the... Uh, Rivals, playing fag. I'm sorry, this may be a bit long-winded. No, but the point is that somebody else who I've been at school with and in plays with called Robert Benton, this is all very bizarre, isn't it? Literally, mm. the, the old boy network, mm. said, uh, you should come and audition for Footlights, which I'm directing this year, the May Week Review. And the May Week Review appeared at the Arts Theatre for two weeks. Then it went on a tour around uh, Britain, uh, going to Oxford and uh, the Robin Hood Theatre in Aram and various places, and then went to the Edinburgh Festival. And so I turned up, I did an audition, and they, and they put me in this review. This was 
extremely rare to go no, straight into a review nobody in the in their <laughs> first year the review was essentially the the, the in may week review was essentially the um uh, prerogative of people who um uh, had been there three years mm. you know sort of they three years they spent a lot of time in footlights I just went there because I'd already then done a lot of theatre of one kind or another and they were looking for somebody and I did a funny audition. So there's a luck element for you? So it was a, a luck element uh, of the sense of being asked, you know, but, but also this slightly strange thing of being um, a clown, which I was, mm. uh, uh, in terms of I was a sort of falling about, gurning, comedian-type clown. And so suddenly... I'm in the May Week Review on the stage at the Arts Theatre uh, at the end of the starting rehearsals in June. But by then, I'd think I'd been to America, I think, with the Universe Production. I'd, I can't remember what else I'd done. But the point was, the, with the people that I knew, I was sort of mixing with slightly older mm. uh, undergraduates. And uh, the, uh, the rivals have been uh, co-directed by Sue Lim. Do you know Sue Lim? She writes uh, for Radio 4 now, yeah. these days. Uh, the... Footlights Review was uh, featured uh, as well strongly. One of the writers, uh, John Lloyd, who went on to produce... I don't know if you've probably interviewed him, maybe. I haven't yet, no. Oh, okay. He's on my list. Well, John is sort of the godfather Mm. of British comedy, really, right up to the present day. And so uh, I went along to this first meeting in, in a sort of student room, and I just remember laughing a lot at... John Lloyd, because I'd never been in an environment up to that point. I'd been in an environment of mates who mm. laughed a lot, but I'd never been in the in the environment of a sort of public school boy who could be, as John Lloyd could, sort of turn on funny monologue style comedy. So Do you like, see what I mean? Yeah, like long form. Yeah. Yeah. Who could Not just storytelling sort of, but no, like but long form yeah, yeah. sort of funny stuff. And suddenly yeah. we're sitting around and this was a very um I, I, I knew Monty Python and I, I was slightly horrified because we we had dancing in it and we had, you know, and we did straightforward, we did a sketch about uh, the importance of being earnest uh, uh, or Oscar Wilde writing Oedipus. So it was like the first time you'd seen something that wasn't the Monty Python stuff. It was. It was like. Well, it was new... like the first time I'd come in and in, in touch with comedy, working through punchlines, working through. Yeah. Uh, Working through sketches, uh, Were working, you working through solo? routines, as the review did in those days. Uh, did you do anything solo at that time? Or? Uh, oh yeah, they gave me things to do. I was in the review. I didn't have to no, I didn't no, no, write I mean, my own material. But did I oh, okay. at that point? Yeah. Well, once I had suddenly sort of found myself, I felt I needed to turn up and appear at Footlights. I mean, I'm still an und- a junior, mm. um, first year undergraduate, but I started to appear at Footlight Smokers. And the thing mm. about a Footlight Smoker, which is very simple idea. I can't. I don't know how many they have. Somebody said they have about three a term. It should be two a term, and somebody was put in charge of it. And their job was just to find enough people to come on and do monologues or sketches or things like that. And all that is. Um, and so uh, I've always said to people who want to become writers, you know, get yourself involved in some process that does that. Get a pub, find a corner, whatever you do, um, just set yourself a target and get in front of an audience that you don't give a fuck about, and you can just. Uh, find out whether you can do things which make that audience laugh. And when when you were doing this, and when you when you were trying out different ideas, yeah, obviously a lot of that scripted. I assume at that point where you were where you were writing down sketches. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, like I did a monologue about a pirate. You know, I went yeah. on as a as a pirate and uh, with a, uh, a, a a sort of ouar type mm. sort of Pirates of the Caribbean, just sort of pantomime sort of stuff with a broom under my. Um, arm and a leg yeah. quite evidently tied up you know yeah uh, which was giving me jip and as i'm trying to tell these terrible jokes the leg gives me more and more trouble and so i shift the broom under the other arm and then fall over and then spend half an hour clambering up that was the sort of thing that i did i did literally yeah. knock about comedy yeah. but it was sort of new enough or different enough uh, or good enough uh for people to go oh wow i remember Jerry Brown, who was there or something, saying, you know, where did this come from? Yeah, that was what I was, I was going to ask whether... Because we were talking briefly yeah. before we started about originality yeah. and trying to find something new. And yeah. and it feels like 
uh, as part of a group, you were trying to each find a voice, but with, within... Yes, like, but not like that. It's not stand-up. There's no stand-up there. No. It was, it's, it's a combined process yeah. of performing. So the review I was in, the first mm. review, had John Cantor in it, mm. who is uh, also uh, uh, an incredible you know, writer, yeah. writes loads for Radio 4, and a, very, and a great writer. He's a very, very close friend of mine mm. ever since. And uh, I began to make very close friends uh, under these circumstances with mm. people who... Who you know, for one reason or another, have remained friends and who I've worked with in various ways and tenfold. And I presume at this point it's all just for fun. Like it's not making money. It's not like a big job. It's it's just part of your university life. Well, yeah, yeah. It's just part of university. It's not. It's not even the sense of saying. Well, I, we never felt very secure about the idea that there'd be a career in this. Yeah. Because. Uh, uh, in fact, all the newspapers were at pains to start every review with saying, "No Peter Cook here, no John Cleese here." Where so th- so? How did that make you feel? Like if if they're looking for the next? Because I feel like that still happens now, where they go, "Oh, this person is the next insert." Let's let's say McIntyre or yes. Jack Whitehall or whatever. It, it, did it did it make you ever want to just try and emulate? The thing that they were looking for, or did or did it make you just want to go? Well, I'm just not going to play that game. No, because we appeared in front of audiences and made them laugh. Mm. So it wasn't a thought of your... Cause, do you know what I mean? Like it's, It feels like there's a system there that you can play. No, but it feels like it you're not. I mean, honestly, it didn't feel anything like that. Or There was okay. no position that you knew of anything, except that what you have to remember is when we went to Edinburgh with mm-hmm. this review, and we'd already been on tour, and mm. by that stage, most of the sketches were... It, it was a well-reviewed review. It was called Every Packet... <laughs> carries a government health warning, shows mm-hmm. which dates it. That was the time, it was the beginning of, of mm. health warnings on. Um, and uh, there were, as I say, some pretty clever sketches in it, but it didn't make any reviewers who came up from London to review it. And the reason they did that was because of the legacy of Footlights, mm. but also because when you went to Edinburgh, there were three comedy shows. There was the Oxford Review, there was the Bristol Review, and there was Cambridge Foot Lies. Mm. And that was it. This was 1970s. In 1973, I suppose. Yeah. Because now it's not like that. Do no, you, do you go to, it's a completely different Even to world. visit, do you go to Edinburgh much? No? no. Okay. When was the last time you went to an Edinburgh? Even as a punter, just a... Five, five years ago, I suppose. And what was, what was your nature of your visit for that one? Versus I, was, I was doing the book. The book. The book stuff. Yeah. So how? I mean, you mu- you've obviously been a few like times as performer rather than just. just I did a lot. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm wondering how you've seen that develop because that feels like that's become less of a well, just well, having fun. Just to, I, I, all I can say is that mm. d- inevitably, when people went to the Fringe and went to the main review, the main the main festival, you mm. know, the reviews were simply late night entertainments for people to have a good old laugh after the they, mm. and with a reputation, mm. Cambridge Footlights, and they were pretty funny shows. Mm. I mean, they they weren't like tryouts. They made people laugh. Mm. So, uh, Bristol reunions just around that time might have had Chris Langham in it, Paul B. Davis. Uh, I remember, and at that point, the the uh, the uh, the Oxford review, which was the one that we were conscious of most, would have had uh, Peter Wilson, who went on, who's still a very close friend of mine, <laughs> and Mel Smith in mm. it. So. I wrote that your first sort of working job within comedy yes. was at BBC Wales. Yes. And that was all No, on. BBC Wales? No. no. Okay. No, oh no, I had nothing to your do with Wales. Your Wikipedia is wrong. Uh, is that what it says? It, well, hang on, it was... Uh, oh no, Brain of Britain at Weekending. No, that wasn't BBC Wales, was it? No, 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 was no, it no before but that's that? also completely wrong. Okay, what was your first paid that's job in comedy? That's wrong. After we did uh, Every Packet, and I can't remember... Yeah. Every Packet didn't go into the West End, did it? No, it went to the Roundhouse. We did a radio show. They did, uh, John Lloyd was mm. uh, uh, given a job at BBC Radio as a producer and he put a radio series together and while I was still an undergraduate uh, I did a radio series called Oh No It Isn't and uh, uh, I just remember we did it I don't even know how we fitted it all in but we must have done it during the summer vacation or something mm. like that. and so that was your first paid job as a yeah and we were modelling ourselves probably most closely on I'm sorry I'll read that again right and when and when so when you got that job, was it a case of because uh, I'm trying to work out 
Yeah, I'm Back still then, an undergraduate. W- yeah. So and that's the first of the reviews I've done. Mm. So by that stage, I'm, you know, still, I don't know, 18 or 19. Yeah. Uh, and I've done the radio show. Mm. And then I go and do another review. And that was on television called uh, Chocks. And then I did a, then I directed a review called, which Douglas had originally directed. And I redirected it. And I, do you know, I can't, rem- oh, no. No, sorry. I was in a. I was in a review directed by. These are all the. These are all the end of the year reviews. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I directed a review by. Uh, goodness me, I was in Paradise Miss Laid. Yeah, Paradise Miss Laid was directed by John Lloyd. So the review that went to radio, how was that? Did it, did it change much? Did it? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was a whole how, series. How did you? I mean, it went you, from being a one-off. Yeah. To a whole series. Well, how how was the process? Because I'm, assu- I'm assuming by that point you haven't really done a radio show. No. So what was that? I mean, I assume because you've got your group around you, it's, you know, you're not on your own. You're not just being thrown at a No, a I was the most project. junior of yeah. the group. Yeah. I wasn't really, nobody, you know, wanted much opinion from me. I wrote <laughs> a few jokes. Uh, yeah. You know, we did, uh, uh, you know, it was a sort of straightforward joke sh- show yeah. in, in a funny sort of way. That was what was, it was like... I'm sorry I'll read that again. It was built 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 around mm. um fairly straightforward joke structures. And uh it was sketch comedy of that kind mm. where you played a whole series of different characters. And I by this stage I was doing I can't even remember the sketches that I was in. Do you mm. know? I can't all the year after that, but mm. Clive it, Anderson was the same year as me and a guy called Simon mm. Levine and uh so there was a lot of stuff that we started to do together. Mm. Uh, yeah. Well, the th- the thing I'm trying to w- trying to work out is, uh, I think most people look at someone who, especially at your level where you've been at TV and radio for a long time, you look at it as they just know what they're doing. You know, they they've done it enough times, they have produced stuff, and and the work's kind of not easy, obviously, but it's it come it, it's because you've got you, you you've got the experience that it's easier to do. So I'm going back to when you first did a radio show, yes. and when you first did a TV or the footlights on TV, yeah how how that process was to convert mediums for one and for two like what it felt like to to be offered that opportunity as as an 18 year old as you said uh, as a very rare case as an 18 well with chocks i think we did uh we did a run in the west end at the comedy theater but mm. we got very very badly reviewed uh, well in london yeah yeah but it went well in edinburgh uh, but like like a lot of shows <laughs> wouldn't the reviewers be the same if they've come from london to edinburgh to review i can't remember they didn't really mean much any more than they s- still mean much because they're not very accurate. Nobody knows. I mean, there was no comedy expert like Dominic Maxwell or something like that. It was just given to the regular theatre reviewers who felt they were demeaning themselves to review a comedy and always have done. Um, because what they don't like is manipulative comedy. They like stuff which is by nature subtle, in which they see the humour, even though the audience doesn't. Uh, or vice versa. And if the audience laughs a lot at something, then they're always rather suspicious of it because they feel they're being manipulated. So, um, for one reason or another, they weren't. They were. Uh, they were bad reviews. But I don't even remember reading them or being very bothered by them because I was just enjoying the experience of doing it. I was very young, and uh, I wasn't. I'm not like somebody today who says, "Can I make it big in comedy?" That's. I'm afraid that's the big distinction. I think, Do you see what I mean? I mean, yeah. people go, "Am I going to be Rick Mail?" Or from an early age. But I mean, I, we none of us thought, "Am I going to be Peter Cook or Dudley Moore or anything like that?" I mean, in other words, I mean, sort of. That might have been what other people said about us, but but uh, this isn't. This bloke's not going to be um, the new yeah. <laughs> thing. And. Jeff McGiven, who still works a lot in comedy, got fantastic personal reviews. You know, the, the funniest bloke in it is Jeff McGiven, but the funniest bloke in uh, 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 Cambridge Circus was Bill Oddy, you know, according to the critics. But I, I think that's, if, if you contextualise that with, with my generation, yeah. if you look at TV now, yeah. there's, there's you know, uh, uh, 50 or 60 comedians on a rotation of, you know, doing spots on TV and on, on, on that sort of, on, on sort of panel shows and on yeah. like Live at the Apollo, that sort of thing. Yeah. And so when you start at my sort of yes. at years, if you like, you watch that and you go, that's something you can do. That's Whereas when you started, there wasn't that. And there no. wasn't really those. This is the reason we got employed. Yeah. <laughs> because there were jobs. Yeah. It, it's very complicated to explain, but mm. it was a completely different. I mean, David Hatch had been employed from, I'm sorry, I'll read that again, 
uh, and from he was the voice the producer and one of the voices in I'm sorry I read that again he was also uh, he was also in the 1963 production and he had gone into radio as a producer which none of the others had like uh, uh, like Graham Garden or none of the others had become career producers and David had and what had become a very very successful BBC man one I worked in radio, but I did an enormous amount of direction as well at Cambridge before I did that. So it wasn't a smooth no. process. I mean, most I did four years at Cambridge. Uh, I did. I was in three major May Week reviews. I did. I did loads and loads of every two weeks. I did another smoker. Um, and uh, but in the meantime, I directed. You know, Cyrano de Bergerac and. Uh, a, plays about kamikaze pilots and Brecht and God knows what. Um, so I'd also sort of been a, across the thing. And I'd also directed, I was later directed, very successful production for the Marlowe Society, so of, of uh, Bartholomew Fair. So I just, I was just a, I was just a, I, I gave up acting. The only, the only acting I did was to turn up and do a couple of comedy routines or whatever in the, in the Footlights Review at the end of the year. I mean, it was like, I was more like, Jonathan Miller, if you see what I mean. I mean, it yeah. wasn't like my whole thing to be a comedian by any means. Yeah. My whole thing was to be a director. But the thing that happened and still happens, I think, at Cambridge and still baffles people is this. You arrive in that place and there is nobody in charge. There's no Don. There's no master. There's nobody saying you will be cast and you won't and you should do this and this is how you do it. You enter it as a maelstrom, as a, as almost a... Uh, 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 a copy of the real world. Um, there are people in charge, but that, unlike the real world, they also go. So after three years, however big they think they are, they're out. Um, and however much they've said, oh, I'm never going to cast Griffiths Jones because I think he's ugly, or I'm not going to cast, I'm not going to give Nick Heitner the job of being president of the ADC, it, the person who's standing in their way goes. And yeah. and anyway, if you're Nick Heitner and you're there at Cambridge and you say, um, well, I'm not getting the chance to do this big production that I want to do, I will organise it myself. And he did. And he went to the, he took the corn exchange and did Mahogany. Uh, Nick Heitner was in, well, I only talk about Nick because he and I sort of ran the ADC and did every other production there. I was actually much more concerned about straight drama uh, at university than I was about comedy. Comedy was just something that I did. Mm. When they asked me to direct the pantomime, I directed the pantomime. When they asked me to, to redirect Douglas's uh, review, Douglas had directed a, um, a review, and I can't even remember what it was called, but the thing that was weird about it was that it was far, 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 far too long. And I know, because Douglas wasn't really a director. Mm. So I came in and I took it over again at... Uh, the uh, uh, at the Edinburgh Review, I cut it right down, shortened it down, made it uh, uh, made it uh, move much more quickly, and directed it. Uh, Simon Brett, who was working for the BBC, came to see it, had seen both productions uh, because everybody knew about Douglas yeah. at those days, but not in a uh, not in don't, Douglas was not at that stage. Douglas Adams, which he was later. Yeah. Douglas was just another, you know, funny writer who wrote very funny sketches. Mm. And uh, uh, when we were in uh, review uh, in London, it said, you know, the best sketches are written by somebody called Adam Smith Adams. And I have no idea, the review said, whether this is one person, two people or three people. Mm. In fact, it was three people. Right. Uh, and uh, and Douglas was part of a writing team that wrote mm. that. But, mm, but what, what it was most connected with was BBC Radio. Mm. with writing not performing not stand-up mm. there were no stand-ups this is really important yeah there was nobody who did stand-up as such um because stand-up was the thing that was club comedians in yeah. northern clubs did nobody got up on stage and told a series of jokes to the audience i mean clive did uh, but that was almost like he would do a uh, a Scotsman monologue or a or a viking monologue yeah. but they were monologues not stand-up acts you yeah. see what I mean? Yeah, they, they weren't were. like so. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so we, I, because I redirected this show and done it very efficiently. Um, they said, "Have a job, <laughs> have a job. Start with us in six months as a trainee producer." Like so, an accidental internship. Yeah, if you like. yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they did that because um, you've got to imagine that the BBC was run by a lot of producers. BBC Light Entertainment was run by a lot of producers who had all joined following the Second World War. Um, from a variety of different prof mm. uh, of uh, positions, not because they'd all worked in um, uh, 
uh, not because they'd all worked in uh, uh, in IMSA or something like that, most of them. I mean, you were still known on a radio uh, corridor by your former title. So the head of... Uh, uh, of the, the BBC Radio was was known because he'd been chief of police in Gibraltar, right. um, the um, head of military police in Gibraltar. The uh, Charlie Chilton had been in the cavalry. Um, right. You you know you yeah. sort of d- very d- discovered that most of the senior producers had all fantastic war records of one kind or another, which had nothing necessarily to do with with comedy, but they'd come into radio producing. They all came up for retirement at the same time. And of there's course, a man yeah. running a department, looking down the thing and going, how am I going to fill this, this corridor? Where yeah. am I going to find new producers, young producers, to do what our, is our stock in trade, which is comedy programmes like The Ken Dodd Show or The Frankie Howard Show or whatever. Where am I going to find these people? And the only people who did that sort of show were the Bristol Review News, the Oxford yeah. <laughs> Review, yeah, Review and the Cambridge so, there was nobody else. So there, was were, no, there was no circuit. When we left, uh, we started when I was at university. We'd done a lot. I'd done an awful lot of comedy. I started to earn money doing comedy because uh, Clive, me, Jimmy Melville and Roy McGrath did a thing called An Evening Without. We did, and the list, the po- it was only the poster had a list of everybody who wasn't in it. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, the poster had a huge list of of. Uh, comic uh, people who were written but written up by Rory and Jimmy we used to do and this was a combination of the sort of the the high hitters of uh, Footlights uh, comedy mm. one of uh, so that you know very very strong um, quickies and cheap gags of one kind or another which we used to do originally as, as sort of what they call the cabaret circuit where people needed entertainment at a may ball or a or a, 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 a wedding or something like that and they just needed a quick fix mm. of comedy and we go and we had some equally horrific experiences to any comedian that you could care to name mm. sometimes where we'd appear at the j walter thompson christmas party and nobody in the entire party stopped talking while we were on right because nobody properly announced us and the stage wasn't lit, but you just ploughed on through it thinking this is the, this is the worst evening I'm going to experience ever <laughs> yeah. in my life. I never want to do this job again. In fact, I remember that one very well because we tried to escape <laughs> from the rainbow rooms down the, uh, through the, uh, at the end. I didn't want to go, well, some of us didn't want to go through the audience. We yeah. felt we'd had such a miserable experience. And as we went down, uh, we went down a whole series of, 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 um, uh, self-closing doors you know uh, from the emergency exit and got to one at the bottom which said if you leave by this exit every alarm in the building will go out so we had to rush back up the stairs catching all these doors and then sneak out only to see Rory sitting having a drink with the chairman of, of Ross Charles Jimmy and I did a show where we went to uh, we went to uh, a friend of his knew we were in Footlights and said we need an entertainment for a major uh, uh, accountant that he joined as an intern really I didn't think people joined as interns in those days yeah. but a very junior accountant we turned up and um, we did the show and he got very very nervous about us coming on and just before we went on he sort of arrived in a state quite drunk and started telling us about what we could do and what we couldn't do and we yeah. weren't because his whole job was on the line now yeah. and what was he going to do you know if we if we swore or said anything untoward so we were sufficiently like comedy players yeah, we've yeah. done this sufficiently to know that the stuff we were going to do as long as we got silence and went on was going to go like fine yeah. so we went on it was a fantastic night we made everybody laugh we finished the chairman wanted to meet us it had been so good and so to come along and meet these young people and while he was talking to us he said where is the young man who brought this couple you know that you two yeah. here and jimmy said oh it's my mate steve and he works for you yeah. steve was summoned by which time steve yeah. had got so utterly drunk yeah that Steve could couldn't stand and had to be sort of dragged in front of the chairman. Nice. And while he was standing there, he suddenly started. You could see Jimmy and I knew very well because we were young enough to remember <laughs> and to know exactly what was going. On. We knew that he was going to projectile vomit, and so both of us hit the floor. And he yeah. just put his hand up like, to try and stop a stream of vomit coming out, <laughs> which sprayed all over the chairman and his wife. <laughs> Uh-oh. But yeah. what? But doing that was where we cut our teeth. You know, that's yeah. actually what comedy was about. Yeah. So we were playing parties, gigs, going around. We would would appear if we want. There was no circuit. If yeah. we wanted to appear on stage, then 
uh, the options were going to places like Derby and we'd appear on a Sunday night. So, or we'd go back to the Arts Theatre in Cambridge and do a Sunday night there. Uh, uh, we did a run at the Arts Theatre, I think, but but this was just a group of us doing uh, me, uh, Jimmy Marvel, who's done very well in comedy, uh, Rory, who did, uh, who's done very well in comedy, mm-hmm. uh, and, uh, uh, and Clive Anderson. Yeah. And occasionally Emma Thompson joined us to do yeah. some of the things and we just we just do it like a, a concert party but a concert party of jokes it was jokes and comedy and sketches and things like that it's like the early the early formalization of just just sort of diy trying out different well ways, trying out. we had we uh martin bergman was part of it martin's mm. married to rita rudman now and uh lives and is a producer in new in los angeles and martin organized it and he was the sort of producer of it and he would find gigs for us mm. so we didn't necessarily want although we ended up doing uh edinburgh edinburgh wasn't like what we wanted to do yeah. but we were so, uh, and in the meantime, this had all grown out of doing these sketch shows. So, mm. if you imagine we'd done four major reviews, which had toured the country, and, doing, and we sort of said, "Okay, let's choose the best stuff from those four shows, mm. the quickest, most audience pleasing stuff, and stick it together in a show." We did that. Mm. So, we had this show, and we absolutely we did that in Edinburgh as well. But, but what had happened in Edinburgh, which changed Edinburgh uh, considerably, was that Rowan uh, did a uh, one-man show. He had... We were sharing a hall. It's a very complicated story, but the Cambridge University Edinburgh Festival group went bust the first year I went up there. They spent all their money hiring Leith Town Hall or Leith Bus Station or something, and they were out of too far out of town Mm. to make any money out of what they were doing, except for the footlights, which always made money. But footlights continued to go. And from that point on, we also became involved in the idea of paying for paying our way because suddenly we, Mm. because what the reviews used to do was make make sure the rest of the university could go and do um, uh, Hölderlin um, or whatever plays, but um, but the review effectively underwrote them when it didn't have to underwrite the rest of those plays it started to make money so we had a great time in edinburgh we would Mm. stay in a fantastic flat just under ramsey court and suddenly you were introduced to the idea that the the pure comedy Mm. uh paid good money if enough people came to see it as they did yeah so we did all that so we had a real background in doing a hell of a lot of comedy and i had started work at uh radio as a junior producer and um uh when I directed, redirected, when I directed Tag, was it Tag? I can't remember which one it was. and I can't remember which the one that... Anyway, um, when I directed Tag, I think it was Tag, uh, we went up to, we were up in Edinburgh and somebody who'd been in uh, 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 in Cambridge and was now working in Oxford came up, you must see this extraordinary performer. And we went upstairs, we were sharing a thing and we watched the Oxford Review with Richard Curtis in it, uh, Angus Deaton and Rowan and Rowan was uh, swiftly acknowledged as a sort of phenomenon mm. but of course he didn't impress us mm. the following <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell him <laughs> <laughs> well of course he impressed yeah, us yeah, okay. but in a funny sort of way yeah. you know you can imagine that the sort of rivalry when yeah. it, we we went to, to watch him do his stuff yeah. you know and, and sort of went yeah yeah well yeah, I'm sure people see say, I'm yeah. sure there are lots of people who like that sort of stuff yeah yeah thing. yeah it, it, it's kind of odd because there's only three three of you or three groups of you doing it oh yeah so, yeah. so I mean, there was not, bound to be a rivalry very very it's very very but, incestuous and everybody yeah. knows each other already yeah. and Jeffrey Perkins who as you know became was was a yeah. feature of the of the um, uh, of the Oxford Review as well well, and we knew so this is a very very close world of mm. people a very small world of people involved in comedy it's not a massive sort of thing and they and they there are only a few reviews and we're all now uh, sort of doing little shows which we'll do as a cabaret. Uh, Rowan was identified and picked up by uh, a London agent as a big star mm. and returned to Edinburgh to become, you know, to do a solo show, mm. which effectively, and I'm sure I'm not the only one to say this, started the idea of Edinburgh as a showcase mm. for one man shows. Mm. It was the, I mean, There'd been other one-man shows, loads of them, but nobody had sort of gone there to do a big comedy turn one-man show. I think I'm right in saying before Rowan Mm. started to sell out with his Edinburgh shows and went on doing so for some years. Mm. I'm back and forth to Edinburgh 
I remember what happened, and the reason I couldn't remember why what happened, I'd redirected uh, uh, Douglas's show. Mm. Then I got the offer on a job. Then I directed uh, the last review I was involved in, which had Jimmy and Rory in it. And uh, I couldn't take it to Edinburgh because I'd taken the job for the BBC. And I remember that uh, I went up to see how it was going in Edinburgh. And that's where I saw Rowan and I saw... Uh, Angus and I was told about the fact that Jimmy and Rory and Angus and Phil Pope and Richard Curtis all had a fight uh, over the use of the Oxford Review Union's review set on a coal lorry uh, which had been sent to put the the, the, the footlights on a tour on a, a, a on a display around they, in those days I don't know if they, they had a sort of fringe parade and for the first time, a piece of paper arrived, say, you are in the fringe parade footlights, you know, while standing a coal lorry. They didn't have anything to decorate it with, so they went and found a pile of stuff in the back of the theatre and stuck it all over the um, coal lorry and went off in it. When they came back, they discovered that that was the set <laughs> of the Oxford Review. Nice. And there was there was sort of... There was an altercation. Yeah. I missed all yeah. that. I missed all that. I was very sorry to miss all that because yeah, yeah. I'd been there trying to calm everybody down. Yeah. But uh, but we but um, uh, Jimmy and Rory could be quite aggressive about things in those mm. days. Um, anyway, so we did all that, and in the meantime, I'm working within the. I'm I've been I've been sent to the BBC, and I was yeah. one of the early jobs I was given was to produce Rowan, which I did yeah. for Radio Three. Mm. Would it and. I mean, there's two questions I want to ask about that, but I want to sort of touch upon this because you you mentioned sort of uh, the, the 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 boys club, the old boys club, sort of earlier on, and and you you uh, I think there's a lot of people that have a misconception about that, and I feel like there's an element what, of what is their misconception? Well, this is the thing is is that that as you pointed out, it's a very it was a very small, closely knit group of three different. Uh, troops if you like yeah and obviously all of you knew each other and because there was no one else doing it and because you've all come up not n different levels at different yeah. times and stuff but you've all come up with each other i think it's easy for people to look at that group now that there's that misconception of the old boys club being being so much in charge of of media and of tv yes, and stuff. okay let me say this um i don't think this is really important because over the next mm. few years things lifted off in a mm. big way and i don't think i don't think there's a lot of choice you see mm. That's what I was going to say. It feels like there, there, because there's only three of you. There's yeah. I mean, what happened is uh, there's talent. I join a no. Well, yeah. there is an element of talent yeah. there. Yeah. I joined a corridor in mm. which Jeffrey Perkins had just joined the year before as a producer. John Lloyd had produced the thing, and John Wiley was there. Sort of these were. Uh, I was never a, a very um, successful radio producer, to be honest. Not as successful as Jeffrey and John. John was sort of senior to me by several years and been there and sort of into the system. Uh, and there was a big, there's a big system sort of thing there, and had started producing the news headlines and the news quiz, which he started uh, there, and the news quiz, which still runs, uh, is, was effectively his baby as a junior producer. He started writing with Douglas uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, which Jeffrey produced. So they 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 had some big hits with mm. those shows and I'm very junior I've only been there about six months so I'm like anybody else I'm given a stint being the producer of Weekending uh, there were a lot of people writing within the department young people writing within the department working the, writing the Burkis way um, and uh, uh, and so we were introduced we did two things we brought everybody from outside in who'd been you know writing for Footlights and Oxford some came in mm -hmm. to start there try their hand but also we met uh people like david rennick and andrew marshall uh who were already writing for radio then mm. i met uh andy hamilton uh and guy jenkin and i was their producer for you know a year and a half possibly even longer two years i don't know but you know so on a weekly basis i'm working with guy and 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 ian we're still very good mates you know so suddenly we're cross fertilizing with a new set of people both Guy and Andy had been at Cambridge when we were there, but I'd never met either of them. And mm. they'd worked through a group called Cules, which did entertainments for, uh, I believe, for hospitals and things like that. I, d I barely even knew of it, its existence. Yes, what was happening, though, in radio in those days? This is the early 70s or the mid-70s now. Monty Python has happened in television. 
uh, and put a an absolute full stop on sketch comedy there's only one other sketch comedy show that is running this is really this is the other thing that people don't mm. that people don't quite realize about the scenery in the 70s there there were any there were any uh three channels there was ITV BBC one BBC two and none of them did young people's comedy which you might call young people's comedy they did the good life mm. uh, and they did uh the Two Ronnies and Morecambe and Wise. And The Two Ronnies was a sketch show which was written by the same guys who used to write David Frost. And they were a coterie. And they didn't hang up a shingle and say, let's hear from you new writers. Mm. Uh, they didn't want to have new writers. Mm. They were a team. They were mm. old writers and they had no intention of looking for fresh blood, mm. as it were. That, that wasn't what they did. They took some freelance uh, jokes from people for, their, for The Two Ronnies bit where they sat at the desk. And it's one of the reasons why, and I can't remember who wrote The Two Ninnies, but uh, I was one, not that I can't use the sketch called The Two Ninnies, we're dancing up, we're uh, marching up and, up and down upon the spot, 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 because the sodding choreographers are twat, twat, twat. I didn't write that, yeah. <laughs> although, uh, funnily enough, I had to yeah. take the flack from Ronnie Barker, who was extremely upset about it, but it was written by uh, comedy writers who had. Uh, 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 who had tried to break into um, the whole world of uh, 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 the two Ronnies without success. The John Lloyd used to labour for days to write one sort of, you know, the man from Huddersfield who's got a Fluddersfield has lost his Huddersfield. He used to, you know, to try and get one of those jokes on. So let's imagine that there's a corridor with people like Laurie Rowley, brilliant gag writers, who have no access to television at all. There are a lot of producers who've come out of backgrounds of doing footlights or things like that, and some who've done all this cabaret work, and, and have, they have no access to television at all. But what they are involved in is a writer's medium that needs writers. It pays them very little mm. money, but it needs writers. It sucks up writers. Comedy needs, mm. as well as great comedy performers much more important than that is it needs and needs to cultivate and find comedy writers and if you're somebody as i have who's worked in in a series of comedy shows with alfred marx and uh, uh, frankie howard and um, and a series of freelance shows around that time and faced the slush pile you begin to realize that there are some people who are funny and not only funny but can write funny and there are some people who can't and they can try very hard mm. they can be very diligent and they can send their scripts in over over again and we as a producer may spend 90 percent of our time talking to them and saying you know i appreciate you've done all this work <laughs> but yeah. i can't use your material mm. because instantly funny instantly my god this script makes me laugh there's no head of department or very few well let me put it this way. Sometimes head of departments, especially when they've not had any experience in comedy, think, I know what's happening here. People are missing the great comedy writers who are coming through. They're not, they're not spotting. Let me read the slush pile. Let me have a go at spotting what they're missing. Mm. I'll sit all night and read hundreds and hundreds of scripts yeah. and immediately spot. And then you're going through and going... Yeah, this is strangely mediocre. <laughs> I regret my choice. Yeah. 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 This is strangely sort of funny, but not really funny. Not structured funny, not understood funny, not going to make an audience. And so the sort of idea that you begin to find people who really can write comedy in that field, an enormously important part of being a producer. Mm. And I was a producer, not a radio performer. I've never been a radio performer. I've had my own show a couple of times. But certainly it was not my intention to be a performer. I was a performer. I was a part-time before I go off and do things. And one night, I'm coming back on the train with John Lloyd. And he'd just been to see us do an evening without in Cambridge. And we were on the train. And what's funny about this is that, in a funny way, John was quite a remote figure. Even though I'd been in various reviews with him, he was a sort of senior figure. He was quite established at the at the... Thing. And although, you know, he was a mate, he had no... This I have to say, in case you're wondering, I used to make a joke about how the fact that, you know, um, if you can't be in uh, 
uh, he was going out with my sister at the time, yeah. and you know, if you can't, you know, if you <laughs> can't, if you can't be, uh, 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 if you can't get into bed with producers, make sure your sister will. Uh, but but that was a joke. Um, yeah. The truth is that John was quite, and he just he said, when I do a show, I'd like you to be in it on TV because his plan at that stage was to do to get into TV and try and make a show, and he did. He got together with Sean Hardy. And they both went, well, he went to see John Howard Davis. He sat with John Howard Davis and said, uh, I'd like to do a topical show. And John Howard Davis said, well, I've just had another bloke from the news department called Sean Hardy in who also wants to do this. Here's a fiver. Two of you go and have a curry and see if you can work something out and bring it back to me. And so they went out and had a curry together and produced um, Not the Nine O'Clock News. And the first pilot was made on the principle and this is a principle which, if somebody's talking about the business, this is what I recommend, okay? Business is comedy. You always get to a stage where you move up, or you find yourself in a, a new world in comedy. And you think, what I really ought to do is meet that there will be much more intelligent, cleverer, uh, funnier people in that new business. And that's where I need to be, and I need to work with them. John Cleese said, after he left Footlights, he went into radio, and he thought... That once he got into radio, he'd be meeting totally professional people who really knew what they were doing, and he was utterly staggered <laughs> no one to find that, yeah. that there, there was less intelligence, less <laughs> imagination in this new world that he was moving into than there had been amongst the students he knew. Mm. Then he moved into television. When he left radio, he thought, "Well, I'm moving on now. I'll find people of higher and and and, and more imagination." I'm only quoting what John said. Then you know, then I'd found in in Radio. To his astonishment, <laughs> he discovered <laughs> that there were more time servers and and untalented people working in television than uh, he had imagined he would ever find, even in radio. I mean, it was just a step down. And he always finished the anecdote by saying, and then I went into films. <laughs> now, the truth is that there's another way of looking at this, which is... What they did in Not the Nine O'Clock News was say, let's get, let's do the first, and they did the first pilot with people they thought were funny, um, who they assembled, actors who they thought, and let's not do this with, you know, barely capable student performers sort of thing. Let's let's go and get some real actors. Let's get some great actors in to do this um, sketch comedy. And it didn't really work. And it didn't work because the thing about sketch comedy performers is that most sketch comedy performers, if they've done a lot, pick up a script and go, oh, this isn't going to work. Or I, I, we, we can do this, but w- why don't we make the following changes? Why don't I, well, I've got an idea for this is to do something outrageous like this halfway through. Or this is great. Don't change a word of this. But actors don't do that. Actors turn up with a comedy and find a way of presenting it, yeah. uh, despite that it's not their job to yeah. say whether a thing is good, bad, or indifferent, or whether they can really make it funnier or work. It's just the job is to act it hmm. as human beings and create something that can make this actually function. So John completely rethought his approach in the after he'd made the pilot for Not Right like News and decided that what he needed was the leading lights of, of people he'd seen being funny. Mm. And he went to Rowan, he went to Chris Langham, and we all knew of Chris because Chris was doing uh, a show and worked with Ken Campbell and had written a lot of material and was doing a one-man show. He was the only person mm. who was, apart from R- Rowan at that time, who regularly did his one-man show. Mm. And he put together that show based around those people. And Mel, who was doing, who I'd seen doing uh, a show, you know, so... Uh, doing a show called have you heard the one about uh, Danny Baker and various other things with Bob Goody and so he rethought the idea of doing Not the Nine O'Clock News but what made Not the Nine O'Clock News successful was its access to all these writers who had wanted to write for TV and were dying to find an outlet in TV but had spent the last five years working in uh, in radio and he hung up a shingle and said do you want to work in tv do you want to write sketches for tv send them in let's have a look and they did and i've never worked on any show where the choice of material of funny material was so strong 
Mm. Because, but he also employed people who wrote their own material and 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 had their own house writers and people he worked they worked with. Mm. So this combination of having the most incredible material from writers like Colin Bostock Smith, who'd written a lot in radio, or David Rennick and Andrew Marshall, or from having uh, 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 a guy and and Andy who were experienced, long experience, yeah. four or five years of writing. Uh, material for for uh, um, radio shows, and it was uh, it was a fantastic and extremely valuable sort of well into which you could dip your bucket. Uh, forgive me for joining the dots. I I, I might have joined yeah, yeah. this incorrectly, but was that why Talkback was started then? Because then you could get your get loads of people to submit loads of stuff into your well. To decide on other ideas. Well, you uh, yes, because what happened was we spent four years doing not the Nightclub News. Yeah. Um, just before not the Nightclub News all opened, uh, I, I went to the the second night, the comedy store, mm. and we did some sketches and material at the, at the comedy store. In fact, I remember I was talking to a journalist once. She said, <laughs> "It was a long time ago." Carol, what's her name? She said, <laughs> "If I had a pound for everybody who said they were at the opening night of." Comedy store, and I said, "Carol, you're talking to somebody who has no need to lie about yeah. being at yeah. the opening night of the comedy store." But the opening nights of the comedy store were an odd combination of people because this was the first outing yeah. of Alexia and people like that to go and try out material mm. on stage at the comedy store. Up to that point, there had been no demand for yeah. no. Uh, 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 outlet for yeah. stand-up comedians or people who wanted to do an act on stage and in fact our stuff because we were coming from a sort of theatre review background didn't go uh, extremely well it went all right but uh, Clive went on you know to, to be there as a regular and as a regular compare but uh, uh, but you've got to imagine that this was there was no circuit mm. it was only a few years later after the comedy store had established itself and and Rick and Aid and various people had all worked through the comedy store that the young ones came along in a new sort of burst. But by then, the thing that was true about Not the Microsoft News, and it's odd because Not the Microsoft News is vaguely thought of as a topical show, and also had this incredible complication uh, uh, of rights and who'd written what, uh, and it's a difficult thing to repeat because you're you're filling in a huge number of forms mm. to pay writers and and credits. What happened there was to was was that. Um, was was it, it broke a dam because the BBC belief had been and shared by an enormous number of people, shared by Douglas and shared by um, reviewers for the first series and and whatever that that not the accurate news that there would never be nobody could ever better Monty Python. Monty Python was the very very last word in sketch mm. comedy. It was, it was it's very very bizarre in the sort of cosmopolitan. Uh, world of comedy today to imagine that one show could have such a grip on mm. on the idea of what constituted worthwhile comedy or a way of of doing comedy mm. so you know um reviewing the guardian i can't remember his name started with not that i could have said if these wankers ever <laughs> the sort of anti aggressive no no the aggressive antipathy mm. to new comedy which I think is less now mm. than it used to be, mm. was so severe in those days. People who had the temerity to stand up on stage and say, laugh at me. I mm. mean, Rowan went to Broadway and had a similar reaction. Mm. You know, it can be... I think a lot of that's changed. I think there's a lot more sort of, mm. you know, openness to the idea that there are people trying out comedy all over the place mm. these days. But in those days, it was an extremely closed shop. So not that I got news was a huge success... I'd been a radio producer all the time that I did it, yeah. except for the last series. I was in the first series um, quite a lot, uh, and uh, Chris had a very different view of what Not the Night News should do um, or be trying to achieve, because Chris came from something which is also sort of forgotten now, which that alongside Monty Python there was a very there was a very alternative world, hip world. There was a big distinction between straight people. And alt people in those days. It's almost, I suppose it's almost impossible to imagine how that, how, how that divide worked. Well, there were, there were fewer people, so the divide would have been would have looked greater, surely. No, you just it's just like in the world of Oz and it and hippies and and freaks 
and there was a the world was literally divided by people on on once into straight people and hip people and you were either side and john was strangely quite a straight person and and chris was very hip and so he wanted the thing to be more hip to be more mm. uh, involved in the world of sort of what was already becoming very quickly by 1979, totally out of date. Mm. And I think that was one of the reasons for their division. Anyway, mm. so I was sort of, I took over for three series, four series, did all that. And then Mel and I started a company together to make radio commercials. By this, before we move into talkback. Mm. And, and I mean, I'm going to sort of put your career into chunks, if that's all right. Yes. So if we do the sort of footlight chunk, yeah. were you picking projects at that point, or were you just floating from whatever was getting offered? I've never picked projects. I've always just floated. Because uh, that's what I was going to ask, because I, I feel like with TalkBack, you'd be able to pick projects much more, uh, you know, just, just what, you, what you like, because it's your company. Whereas when you maybe were working for the BBC, you'd have to work around what they want to show on TV and so you'd be put on, you know, you're going to you're going to direct this show, you're going to produce that show. And I wonder what the difference was with that for you. Well, I, you know, I directed Frank, I produced Frankie Howard for mm. three years while I was doing Not the Night Talk News. Mm. So I sort of crossed a lot of frontiers, a lot of different sort of types of comedy. And I think Mel and I have both been producers. Pam and uh, Rowan were very much performers and Mel and I both being directors and producers still felt a little bit like we were directors or producers who happened to be now performing for yeah. a bit and probably assumed we'd go back to being directors and producers again mm. but in terms of picking projects in terms of I don't I don't know I don't know what you what you can't pick is a success no of course but I mean creatively when you so when you're in a yeah. success and it happens it's amazing and fantastic and uh and uplifting and you sort of assume uh if you're naive that this will this is infinitely repeatable yeah <laughs> this sense of being the um the uh, uh the center of attention uh, the thing that is the zeitgeist yeah. the absolute you know uh 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 you know the top of the top at the time which not the night news indisputably was mm. at the time yeah, uh, it. I mean, I think some of the repeats on BBC One got 18 million people watching. It was a huge thing, mm. and it used to get uh, sort of the front pages of uh, every tabloid newspaper going because Pamela was a sort of uh, fantasy object for the average uh, uh, the average journalist, and so uh, that she was all over the front page. Everything she did was on the front page, and it wasn't extraordinary. It was like being in rock and roll. Mm. Especially because there was no, there was no, there were no rivals. There was mm. nothing else on. Nothing else which would constitute mm. as being even young person's television, let alone mm. young person's comedy. Mm. So um, it it there have been shows which have related to that vitally important sixth form of teenage audience, sort of fourteen year olds up, um, like boy bands, if you like, and throughout the history of the 80s uh, right up to the present day they come along in waves mm. not the nine o'clock news uh, uh, the young ones the fast show uh, little britain you know they they have and they each have their generation that is completely mm. adherent to them mm. because when you get to the age of 30 you're more picky and you're less of a fan anyway or less of a sort of abject fan so there we are I mean, uh, it, not the Night News was one of those, and it became for its generation the same as Monty Python had been for for us. So it must have been whether it was as good, whether it was as valuable, whether somebody's writing the history of comedy, you know, and will say, "Oh no, 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 you don't understand," you know, the young ones did this or whatever, the Little Britain did that, or yeah, the Fast Show took, you know, mm. that's irrelevant. The truth is that, like pop stars. In the great history of things, they just they come along. When you were in that show, when you were working yeah. on that show, did you think of it as like, oh my god, I'm in? Because because you started in your mind with Monty Python and, and and loving that show. Did you think, oh my god, I'm in this generation's version of that, or was yeah. it not? I mean, you thought. I mean, as I say, it was like being a, a rock star. It was 
amazing everyone sort of i assume you were f- f- that's first fame was that like fame yeah uh, uh there's a lot of work involved of course, so when you're working you know mm. you don't enjoy fame as much <laughs> and the beginnings of money but uh but i think both mel and i were slightly surprised when it came to an end mm. both because we'd been on a rocky road of knowing that <laughs> you can be in good things and you can be in bad things. Yeah. You can be in really, really good things that nobody goes for. You can be in really bad things that yeah. uh, that just completely flop. And why, mm. when you're in a huge success, bring it to an end quite so quickly? But uh, uh, that's what they did. If it yeah. had been American, if it had been a sat- cause Saturday Night Live start at the same time, mm. still be running. Yeah. In, in terms of talkback, then when you when you were applying for yes. people to, I mean, well, let, let's let's go from day one from talkback. Yeah. You wanted to create your own TV shows, I presume. No, not at that stage. No, no? No. We, the actual history was, uh, I wrote radio commercials for Mm -hmm. the Not The Nine O'Clock News product. Yep. And Mel and I used to write sketches together uh, for Not The Nine O'Clock News, occasionally. Some of them were quite good, some of them were not so good. Um, But we we did our bit, you know, uh, and wrote. And uh, these uh, commercials were very successful. Mm-hmm. And one of them, I'd, I, I got a guy called, uh, I got a plumber in the, in the, it, it, who'd come to the studio to read it because I felt that I needed somebody. He said, I can't read very well. And I said, that's exactly what I want. And uh, he just read it straight out saying, mm. the script saying, hello, my name is Alan Billiard. I am the head of BBC Records and Tapes. Usually we produce utter rubbish like Victor Sylvester and his singing strings. So you cannot imagine how thrilled I am to be able to produce, <laughs> sell you, uh, not the nine o'clock news record, but the very fact that he, you know, it. anyway, yeah. that sort of thing we mm-hmm. were doing. And uh, I'd been I'm working in BBC Radio. I had to go and see David Hatch and say, David, I've used up all my leave. They're doing another series of Not the Nine O'Clock News and I haven't got enough leave to go and do this. I think I'm going to have to leave BBC Radio as a radio producer. And he said to me, I remember him so vividly, he said, uh, he said, well, don't come back here looking for a job. And I said, okay. And so I, uh, I left BBC Radio. I didn't have a job. And I'd had a secretary and an office and a stream of scripts to produce and a sort of, you know, all the time I'd been doing Not The Mm. Nine O'Clock News, I'd had all this other work to do. Mm. And I thought, well, what the hell am I going to do? I actually entered a sort of limbo Mm. um, in the last series of Not The Nine O'Clock News. Quite frightening. A funny sort of way when you'd just been a, I don't know, just an office worker. And, uh, And so I said to Mel that we could set up a company to try and make radio product of one kind or another because there are all these new radio stations and they all were supposed to broadcast a certain amount of drama or mm. comedy and we thought they'd buy comedy so we went to peter cook and we made uh, a thing called a pilot for a thing called uh, tales from the crypt with peter cook and then peter didn't want to do it and so andrew Sachs did it instead but it was written by roy mcgrath and it it was it was a very funny sequence of tiny little uh, heavily produced um sort of uh, comedy thrillers about a, mm. a Dutch taxi driver who who was an authority on the paranormal and right. everybody and so these things were produced and we made them for Capital Radio but we, there was no money in it we started making radio commercials and mm. then we became hugely successful at making radio commercials I mean we never made any money yet they, mm. you don't make a lot of money making radio commercials but they were very very successful radio commercials they were successful all over the world what, what, was, what was the measure then if it wasn't money that was successful was oh it just- we won I think there was one thing with international awards right. for radio commercials in America, right? right? And we, of 21 Clios given out, yeah. we won 13 of them. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, for different campaigns. Mm. So that's how good it was. Mm. <laughs> I mean, we were, we became the top radio commercial, funny radio commercial yeah. operators in the world. But we still don't make any money mm. because the way you made money in the advertising business was to buy and sell the advertising space mm. so we learned pretty quickly running an advertising business that unless you actually dealt as big agencies mm. did then big agencies like Saatchi's or, or Ligus Delaney or anybody were prepared we won we won fantastic you know gold DNA D's and things like that which are sort of the fantasy mm. of if you meet a somebody who works in advertising and that you say I've won a gold DNA D they go wow because that you know they 
they often don't even give one mm. every year. You know, so we'd won all that. So we'd won all this stuff, but we made no money because basically it was two blokes sitting in a in a recording studio talking to each other. And the, the only way that production companies made money in those days was by um, putting brass bands in or hundreds of uh, effects or trying to get crowds of people into the recording studio because they could charge for all that. Mm. We couldn't charge very much. Yeah. We and could. we and we didn't deal in the advertising space. So uh, we made a lot of uh, corporate stuff as well um, with me and Mel. And uh, we'd set that company up uh, as a radio company. We were doing all that. And uh, I got invited by uh, uh, pro- uh, Injury Time. Do you remember Injury Time? Tony Robinson. Meaningless to you. No, sorry, yeah. I don't remember it. With Rory and Jimmy. One of the very early sketch shows on Channel 4. Mm. Produced by Denise Donahue and Jimmy uh, with a company called uh, Hat Trick. Mm-hmm. And you know Hat Trick. I know Hat Trick very well, okay. yeah. It was their first thing. They mm-hmm. got away with Channel 4. And they said, because uh, these were all the guys I'd done an evening without with, and they said, come and do this with me. And I said, I don't really want to get back into another sketch show. I don't, I've just left, not that I can use. So there we are. There's a choice. Yeah. So I said, the problem is I don't want to do another sketch show. So I went to see Mel and said, I don't want to do that, but why don't we better go and see John Howard Davis? Why don't we, since we're working together, try and do a, a double act show? Yeah. So he said, okay, we went to see John Howard Davis. John Howard Davis did make a pilot. The pilot was actually amongst the best stuff we ever did. <laughs> <laughs> So what you want, a, you want a front load. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, it was fantastic, the pilot. Mm. But very long form sketches, yeah. funnily enough. And Doesn't TV favour shorter sketches? What? Don't well, uh, not that I can't use, it was much sharper, yeah. uh, faster sketches. And of course, the fast show got faster than yeah. that. Yeah. But we were do- we did quite long because we wanted to do stuff which was mm. sort of just the two of us. And we'd done some of the classics, not that I can't use, mm. uh, Mel and I had done together. And we made the pilot. And John Howard always said, this is fantastic. Uh, uh, we want to do this. In fact, we then made a Christmas sketch for a compilation that they were doing, which was also great. Uh, and that worked really well with Mel, as a, which I loved, which I wrote, which was just a sketch about Mel being in hospital over Christmas and settling down to watch the, you know, the sound of music and all that. Mm. And uh, with a nurse saying, you'll be all right and everything. And just we're going. And then a hospital visitor turning up and saying, oh, hello. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, was, it was just a great sketch with just me ruining his Christmas by yeah. turning up by being this lonely bloke who needed somebody to talk to him. It was great. Mm-hmm. We did that. All this had be- meant that we were now, as far as the BBC concerned, they thought this is great because they'd made um, a big and very expensive pilot with Pamela. Mm. But that hadn't quite worked. Mm. Uh, and so they'd spent a huge amount of money on trying to relaunch Pamela Stevenson as the next big thing. Mm. But that hadn't quite worked. They'd, they'd also started Blackadder. And the first series of Blackadder went out about the same as the first series of Smith and & Jones. And we didn't get it right in the first series of Smith & Jones, but, um, but the second series, the Jamie Ricks series we did, second series, third series, fourth series, fifth series, five, first five series on BBC Two were very, very hot shows. They were very efficient in the Not Nine O'Clock News mould, if you like, of sort of sketches yeah. and quickies. And if I look back on one of those, I go, that's a terrific show. Most of them. I'm interrupting this podcast to bring you an urgent bulletin to let you know that you're about to hear an advert, or you might be about to hear an advert. We've By this point, you probably are aware of what's about to happen. I'm going to tell you there's going to be an advert, but you might not get one because not every podcast gets an advert. So uh, let's let's see if you did. Now! That was your advert, or not. If you didn't get an advert, here's an advert for you. I'm doing the Edinburgh Fringe with my fourth show. Every room becomes a panic room when you overthink enough. It's in the grass market at Sweet Venues at 8.35pm every single day, except Wednesdays when I get rudely awoken by the dustman. It's £5 a ticket. There's a link in the show notes. Come and support me. If you've never supported me or never supported the podcast, here's an ideal chance to do that. If not, come see me on tour. There's a link below, a link below, a link in the show notes for tour dates and for preview dates. And I'm always gigging. I'm always bouncing around the country. So if you would like to support me uh, and help me make some money back from these podcasts, then that is a good way of doing it. Um, and I'd massively appreciate it. Let's dive back in. I hope you're enjoying the pod. I'm really enjoying putting this together. I'll tell you now, I am massively enjoying putting this one together. We've covered loads. We've still got like an hour more content coming your way. How exciting, right? Let's jump back in. Don't most, because I mean, 
most, uh, and it might just be yeah. sort of uh, looking back in hindsight on shows. Yeah, I feel like shows obviously they develop and they get better as they go yeah. through. And when you first start, you 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 have an idea of what you're going to do, yeah. but but it, it's obviously going to develop more. Yeah. So, I've, uh, do you ever look back on like say series one or episode one of shows you've done or, or shows you produced and sort of go, well, I wouldn't have done it like that anymore. No, I but you see, look, the t- the difficulty is, and the complicating thing is that I was a producer who produced sort of you know jokes comedy mm. sketches um and so what can i say about smith jones in in the end we wanted to do we tried various different sketches and probably we had a sort of a, an element of it which was front of cloth stuff you know where we were sort of look more like more and wise which wasn't successful and we mm. should have cut that um still sometimes they were the best sketches we did so during its long long life mm. and i'll expl- come to that and explain that in mm. a little bit we tried all sorts of different approaches to doing sketch comedy uh, through it, um, including uh, the Christmas special, which was repeated, which written by uh, 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 Robin uh, Driscoll, uh, was that he'd written a whole series of sketches we did about the, the early days of video, of the video family. Mm. And we went off to make um, a Christmas special for the BBC. I can't even remember when it was. But the Christmas special was great. It was the video family's uh, Christmas Christmas and that Christmas special which was shown just the other day actually as part of the um, of a part of a tribute to Mel that uh, I've been cr- just done a tour of Australia and been met by people who say we pl- we play that Christmas special every year mm. and they know it very well when I was in Blackpool I was really amazed when I met Peter Kay Peter Kay and he said he and his sons can quote huge chunks of that particular christmas special which which i haven't seen since we made it mm. but he said to me then peter k said that was amazing because that whole thing was the first of the really naturalistic comedies done mm. as say quasi documentary realistic sort of stuff shot apparently badly but with a great deal of skill you know mm. um, to sort of first have that sort of style to it mm. uh, which influenced so many people at the time and you go I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and also... Because you weren't trying to. You were no, just no, doing no, no, no. We yeah, did yeah. it because we thought it was funny. Yeah. You know, that's that's all. Yeah. And I think most people... I mean, there may be lots of people who have a vision and want to do this and want mm. to make a breakthrough and do all that stuff. We did things because the, we were what we could do. It wasn't what we wanted to do. It's what we thought we could do and make funny. The head-to-head thing we did for so long started because we used to do radio commercials like that. And it was it was we it wasn't based on uh, Pete and Dud. It was based on two comedians called uh, Dick and Bert, who used to do American um, uh, commercials, which we thought were great when we first heard them when we were making commercials because they were full of pauses and sort of talking over each other mm. and sort of not I don't know just a way of and just bare mm. just like two people talking about a product. And mm. so we started this, and this is when we became extremely successful as radio as radio commercials makers doing these pieces in which people were in which there were pauses there was because the fashion for radio because still is to see if you can get as many words into your 30 seconds as possible (laughs) and our fashion was to get as few words into 30 seconds as possible and that made a difference and we just took the microphone uh which we'd done these things out of the picture and just sat against the black background and that was how we started doing these head to heads which became our stage show where we just sat on two stools and did the same thing for an hour and a half but but the point was that we were a freelance show and we started doing it for the bbc and then we wanted to bring it into our own production company uh which we did we'd started our own production company because i felt that we needed we could because we had a a, a structure we had an office and we had people in it because for everybody who says we're going to be a producer why aren't why don't i produce my own show some of the things that you need to be a producer are quite expensive Mm. yeah (laughs) you you probably need uh you need an office Mm -hmm. Um, you will need to man the phones you will need to be there all the time as producers should be Mm. and you will need to uh, uh, have an income of some kind. And by having a show, Smith & Jones, we could effectively have mm. a strong income. We already had an income from all the radio and production mm. things we did. Peter Bennett-Jones, who set up 
Tiger Aspect, which is the other great player in comedy at the, at the so time. So PBJ? He, PBJ, yeah. yeah. Was PBJ, yeah. Was a friend of mine from university. Hmm. He'd, he and Andre Chizinski, who used to run the really useful theatre company, had set up a theatre company, which they had in the Roundhouse, uh, in an office in the Roundhouse, on loan from Thelma Holt. We set up the radio production company, and we went to see them and shared an office with them originally to run our radio production company. Mm. Peter, who used to be, who was an effective producer and produced all the stuff I'd done at university, he took over the running of the administration of it. And then we got so much business that we could move to Carnaby Street and we had an office in Carnaby Street. We had a little house in mm. Carnaby Street. But that was paid for by commercial work mm. that we were doing, which was using our comedy success as it were to build on commercial success that meant that by doing that we did it as it were the reverse way out we yeah. took any job that we felt we could do in fact we were in brewer street yeah. first of all and those jobs included uh doing conferences and, pr and providing all that stuff and that provided us with a base to start an independent production company at a time when there were very few independent production companies. Mm. Now, oh, yeah. <laughs> there are thousands of independent production. There are hundreds yeah. of thousands yeah. of independent production companies. In those days, there were very few. They're just trying to do what you did. Yes. You know, so yeah. after we'd been in, we'd obviously done well enough to move into Carnaby Street. And I can't even remember the date. So we started this in 1982, 81, 82, talk back, and then it ran as a radio production and, and commercial productions right the way through until about 1986, something like that. Mm. Then we said to, I said to Peter, I want this, I, want, I think we should go into television. Um, I think we've been making this. We should try and branch out to be a, a, in film as well as radio. And although we're making these, uh, these productions, we've got to expand as a business. Mm. And he said, yes, I'll do that. Then he came back to me and he effectively said, I've got a company and I'm, I want to set up a company with uh, mm. Mike Russell Hills. Uh, and what we want to do is offer you and Mel a certain percentage. And I said, well, actually, you know, that, that, does, that doesn't work because you've been working for us. I have no hard feelings about this. If you want to go and set up a company under those terms, mm. we won't have anything to do with it. And we'll set mm. up our own company. So he left and set up his own company. And coming down the stairs was uh, Peter Fincham, who'd been producing us in corporate mm. work and had also been... Uh, the piano player for an evening of that. I said to Peter, do you want to run Talkback and all this operation here? And Peter said, no, uh, I don't actually, I'm making good money as I am just being your independent producer. So if that's all right with you, I'll pass on this. So I said, oh no, no, come on, we'll cut a deal which will make this worthwhile for you to do, which is all to do with incentives. And you know, uh, basically you can have most of the money that we make. Mel and I, as long as you, you know, we'll give you, I won't go into the figures, but they were very, it was a very good deal. So if you make any money out of this company, you know, rather than rely on just being a producer of these things, you can do, but one of the things we so have to do is So it's like shares in it, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, not shares. No, not official shares. No, not like, shares. No, no, no. He oh, had okay, shares. Sorry. So for those of you interested sorry, in business, yeah. this is the actual way we did it, which was to say you have a small number of shares or mm. uh, compared with the amount that Mel and I have. Mm. But the incentive is the more you make... Uh, on a yearly basis, the more money you will take mm. out of the profit. You're not on a salary. You'll have a small basic salary. You're like a profit. Sh but you'll have a profit share. Profit share, okay. So, uh, in other words, but several things are, yeah. and this is probably what people in the business would mm. like to learn, okay, mm. and I can only offer this. Do it when you're young because... I've missed the boat then. Well, you, may, <laughs> you may have. If you're young, you're not, you haven't got dependents and you're not, um, you're not a member of a gym and you don't have a family to support. And so if you're going into an enterprise where actually you can work quite hard, but uh, uh, to begin with, make no money, but, you know, gradually mm. make more money, that's a better position than having somebody who comes in and says, of course I can do this with you, but I will need a salary of 400000 to keep myself going. Because then you have to borrow money to mm. do that, and you borrow money and you find yourself uh, trying to sell product on the basis of we've got to do something to keep mm. ourselves going whereas if you're starting young enough use your friends don't believe that there's somebody who's more expert than you are um, because that person who's more expert most of the things that are complicated you can give to contractors like 
uh, mm. like accounts, lawyers, you know, things like that, don't believe that necessarily what you need to do is, to, you know, which most people do when they're setting up a business, they think we must have somebody who's, you know, who's in the business who really knows this, who's got the contacts. Because mm. if they're looking for a job with a Tupney Hapney company like yours, are they really that good? Mm. So uh, I'm always wary of this sort of, we've got to employ high scale profession later on if you're big that's a different case altogether but or if you're funded by sky or somebody and somebody's on the banks and venture capitalists and they've given you 10 million to dispose of then into that in that circumstance <laughs> employ the people who can at the yeah. highest level and go and probably if you're the owner of shine or something like that then that's probably the way that you go and buy. Mm. You buy your way into the market by simply going and buying really clever ideas from Master Chef to whatever. Mm. But if you're starting and you're just being dependent on your talent, gather, as we did, talented people around you, that's all, looking for independence. But the environment was incredibly different. Yeah, yeah. Incredibly different. Because Peter went away, and with Mike Russell Hills, they set up Tiger Aspect. Round the corner were Hattrick, and there was us. And we were the only people really operating independently in comedy at the time. And um, probably people would correct me immediately and say there were loads of people. But they were the three. Now, we, there were three people. They were three people who'd known each other. Me, uh, oh, well, Peter Fincham working for me, mm. uh, and Mel, uh, Jimmy Marvel, and, uh, <laughs> and Pete Brent Jones. Mm. We'd actually all been in the same production of Bartholomew Fair that I directed at. <laughs> at Cambridge they three set up companies not on the basis of I will help you set up your company are you mad yeah. of course not in fact Jimmy had um, directed produced um, early editions of Smith and Jones as well mm. so they had all worked for me at one stage or another mm. but they basically all started off with the, on the understanding that if those bastards can do it so can I yeah not I mean that's a very good that's a very good reason for setting up companies. Mm. If a friend of yours set up companies having success of it, mm. ask yourself, is that friend of yours really that much more talented or cleverer than you are? Um, but the third thing is get into a, a stream or a business or an area which is not ossified yeah. and not... Because independent production now is dominated by large-scale companies. It goes far as to say, and probably this is the point where you might have to consult with your lawyers, that many of the people who to accept commissions within um, the people who are commissioners they accept commissions from big companies because they're thinking I will go to that work at that company later if you set up as a small company and go to what interest do they have in you uh, and anyway if you do go be young enough for them to gain something by finding you hmm. it's become such a an incestuous involved business where people you know where the whole idea of a commissioner is I mean we didn't have access to commissioners we had access to the controllers they, mm. they, we had access to the DG the director general when we first made our project we were invited to, to go for uh, 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 tea Mel and I and we couldn't work out what this was about <laughs> with the director general Michael Checkland and things like that all in a room and things. we couldn't work out what on earth this was about mm. this meeting and it was to look at us <laughs> they just wanted to see who the fuck we thought we were <laughs> setting up a company to make independent television when they were all the panjandrums of the BBC who'd been who'd worked their way up through news and current affairs and things mm. like that to run who do the people think they are and that was it was a magical time mm. we had a we had a great great time but the point about and the reason we kept Smith and Jones going for much longer as I say I think we reached a really classic we, we did some really great material but we did 13 series 11 series i think over 13 years that's a lot of material mm. that's over 6000 material and if you if you wanted to repeat it you should edit it down and if if uh, if we were sensible we'd go back to the owners of all these programs and say let's do an edited version of these programs because we have a very hot program but we carried on doing it because we were freelancers mm. we were encouraging um, writers to come and write for Smith and & Jones. And so we had a lot of people come through the door who we valued and who we found other jobs for and who started by working. Because if you're a company like we were and you don't have a, a, a job which says you could get a job 
you know, you don't have a show, which you say, come and do a stint on it, how are you going to find out who's good? Yeah. So it had an immense value for Talkback, quite apart from the fact that it was a repeating series. I mean, if you're lucky enough as a production company to have a series that just goes on, just gets recommissioned. We were, I was always astounded. Mm. I mean, that was what's so weird. Uh, but it always did extremely good figures. So it always just got recommissioned. So it's uh, also syndication money and, and uh, what's it called? A resi- residual fees when it's there getting repeated? No, it? no, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of residual. It, paid, it, it sold quite a lot in uh, uh, Scandinavia and Australia and places like that. But but I don't, I mean, I, I don't, I never really got involved in that side of okay. the, the business very much. I just, uh, I had my head down. I worked on that show uh, most of the time. And, and in the meantime, I... Uh, through Loretta, who said you should listen to Amanda Yunucci's show on BBC. Uh, so I listened to Amanda Yunucci's show, and I said, Peter, let's meet Amanda, um, Amanda, and off we went. Um, and Peter sort of then developed uh, Chris and Amanda, and um, uh, uh, and Peter did some. Fan- I mean, Peter was the real foundation, and uh, mm. is a genius producer. That was fantastic. It was amazing. But uh, then I went to do the bookworm, and I'm working on the bookworm, and uh, uh, and I'm working with uh, 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 Daisy Goodwin. And so, and I think Daisy Goodwin is pretty important and successful. So I said, Daisy, you better come meet Peter, leave the BBC. And she left the BBC and went to work for Peter. Talk about she They produced, uh, you know, The Apprentice and all the rest of it. What um, What's the one, you know, for Channel 4 that about? houses um oh the grand designs grand designs yeah, yeah. and yeah. that sort of thing and that was so my role was minimal but uh, in the building of the company under those circumstances but crucial in certain ways and it was my decision to sell the company as well so you know so that all sort of worked out beautifully when you when you were um sort of like selecting shows and stuff did yeah. you did you go to channels and find out what they wanted and try and find something for spec or did you well, peter go had, to channels and say peter we've had, got this not me okay peter had a very very close relationship with the people who wanted comedy but the way mm. that talkback worked was it was both a talent agency mm. and uh and a production agency mm. so that it represented people as well as doing their shows which is a dangerous double thing because it sometimes meant that people who came as as performers to join the agency were frustrated when their shows weren't mm. <laughs> they weren't represented enough in the, yeah. in, the in the thing but uh, but it meant that uh, graham norton was with talk back you see what i mean i mean yeah. there were a number of people who who and then now it's it's divided up but it was it was very much led on the basis of the same as smith and jones which was you come in you're given a room. Our job is not here to tell you what to do. Your job is to be a genius, create stuff, be and funny, so, be funny <laughs> yeah. and do something fantastic. That means that what Peter's eye was very good at was finding the right people and the right producers to do that work and to be geniuses and come up with that stuff and make it happen. Not, in fact, he had a meeting with Endmore. And Endemol said, you know, our job is to come up with formats and structures for television in which nobody of any talent is necessary at all. And Peter said, well, we are actually a talkback completely the opposite, yeah. where we come from exactly the opposite spectrum, that mm. if we, if the show isn't dependent upon the people who make it, um, then don't come here. If you, in other words, it, don't come to us and say, what can you do for us in terms of putting... A, although that was also possible because we knew a lot of producers by then. But... Mm. We dragged in people from various directions. I mean, I'm sitting at the slush pile, you know, with John Plowman and Jim Pullen. Do you know Jim Pullen? Mm-hmm. Uh, I know John. I had John Plowman on there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Jim was very important, um, who unfortunately died a few years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. But, and stuff started coming in, which was just brilliant, written by two guys in Ireland. And so... I said, okay, get them over. And uh, <laughs> you go, okay, uh, well, they live in Ireland, they live in Dublin. Well, anyway, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Let's see if we're far away. And in the end, I gave them a flat to stay in. And, and uh, Graham Lynn and, and Arthur Matthews sort I know, of started. Arthur, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Cool. And yeah. In, in terms of selling talkback and, and moving on from yes. it, 
Wh- what was where, where was your thought process on my thought process is very simple like yeah. this I don't think well, everybody's very happy in the end but mm. it was quite a fraught idea um, not that I I mean uh, Smith and Jones finished mm-hmm. uh, and uh, I think somehow our role as the owners of the company <laughs> was slightly seen as what's this about yeah. possibly and because uh, we weren't so much of a sort of contributing agents, I mean, quite quickly there was sort of like, like, oh, sort of a lot of discussion on that level. And I always used to say, well, we are him. <coughs> we're like the Murdochs, you know. We're not going to necessarily just because we don't. Mm. Anyway, that, but that wasn't the. We got an offer from uh, somebody, Endemol, I think yeah. it was, to buy Talk Bay. Mm. And I said we should entertain it only on the basis that I had a friend who'd been in the computer industry many many years ago when acorn computers there was apple but there was acorn there were lots of little computer companies like apple mm. producing little computer things and quite especially sort of silicon valley in cambridge across britain mm. and they produced came and this friend had sold his company quite yeah. early on to ibm for quite a lot of money but mm. all his friends who are in the business said are you absolutely mad you know why are you selling your company mm. You know, we're just we're here. You're going you, you're going to be as big, big as IBM. But mm. in fact, they weren't. Mm. They weren't as big as IBM. You can't all be IBM. No. no. And actually, as a consolidated business goes on, the consolidation was beginning to happen, and uh, it's happened a lot subsequently. That people have bashed as soon as a small production company has a success, it's gobbled up by a bigger production company. Mm for not as much money as we sold talk about but because we were the first we'd been the first mm. to begin and we were the first out of the game <laughs> and i just believed i'm sure peter would dispute this <laughs> mel can't dispute it he wasn't here but uh, uh he wasn't there he wasn't involved in it yeah. peter and i were more involved in that but uh, but but actually i really believed that this was a sound time to be there was a demand for People wanted to buy a company like us, and in particular the people we sold it to, for a very complicated cross-sales business, mm. which was to do with share prices and an internet boom mm. from the in the late 90s. It, it felt, I mean, from my research into yes. it, it felt like it was very much a, a moving point for you because then you went more into presenting stuff and, and, your, and your current com- production well, company. Uh, what I realised, and, and this is for those in the business, let's face it, you know, then when we had that meeting with the BBC, with the particular, who told us that, you know, he's finishing Smith & Jones, I was relieved. I'd been, Mel had been increasingly not involved in it. So I'd been, like, digging this myself. There'd been producers, and, and Jan Magnusson, very, very good producers. But it's very, very complicated when you feel more, and increasingly, that you're taking the weight of the mm. whole thing. And I'm a, a competent writer, um, but not a, not a, it, you can't, you can't write uh, that many hours of sketch comedy <laughs> just drive you crazy yeah. you you know you go I'm quite proud of about six or seven sketches that I wrote in that period but the rest of it you know is, is hack work you know and you're just trying to think and also yeah. very difficult to find the sort of energy to sort yeah, of keep yeah, yeah. doing it especially I always felt that what you need essentially to be a great comedy writer is a partner you need somebody you love who you mm. can meet like a marriage and even mm. Billy Wilder had 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 uh, um, um, I.A. Diamond, whoever he was, who and the two of them would write scripts together. You know, it's very, it's very difficult. And without Mel, concentration on it or focus on it, and somehow just presenting like my own material to Mel and Yone for them to make judgment on became very complicated for me. Mm. So I wasn't, I wasn't. But we've been doing a particular type of sketch which I'd loved writing, and I wrote with Jim Pullen and Colin Bostock Smith, and various people, and we loved it. Mm. Um, and with uh, Mark, and that was a sort of semi-sitcom stuff, which runs through the whole of the last two series, which I really enjoyed doing. And there was one which was like, which saw the writing on the wall. It was a sketch about writing a, a, a leaving card for a woman who's pregnant, right? And we do them as running sketches through the show. Mm. And this was a sort of limbo that Mel and Griff, as people, lived in. Mm. And so uh, the joke was that somebody comes in with a leaving card for Valerie. You know Valerie, don't you? And we go, yeah, yeah, yeah of course. And they say, will you, uh, will you, it's just a pregnant, you know, she's going because she's having a baby and everybody's written a note in the card. And we open the card. And of course, the things that people have written are so funny 
and affectionate. And so we've just got to write something as Mel and Griff. And uh, we start to argue about what we should put down. We can't think of anything funny or quick or literate or whatever. And it just develops into a thing that really ruins our life. You know, there your next scene is us at three o'clock in the morning still trying to write a funny comment for the mm. for the thing and then only discovering that somebody and, and then and then the next scene is us with six or seven really expensive paid writers who've been brought in <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to help us write this this birthday yeah. card. Yeah. And arguing with them and shouting them yeah, down yeah. And, and people coming up with ideas and finally we finally get the full line in and we yeah. put it in the card. And then uh, we're just finishing off the card, as it were, to get it into get it into the card. And obviously she comes in and she comes in, she's had the baby and all that stuff. That's the punchline to the whole thing. But, <laughs> but what was great about doing this, yeah. what was funny about that was two things. One, we were doing them as part of the sketch. And nothing, mm. we'd never have done anything like that in the first series. So mm. every series we mm. moved on to something which we felt was we were doing new or different whatever but not regular in fact the review said with no apparent irony they bring in six or seven writers to write this right. and you thought with no apparent yeah. irony we have we have lacerated ourselves yeah. in front of you yeah. deliberately and said look we've made a joke about the number of writers we have writing with us things yeah. like that in front of you yeah. in public and you're apparently saying we're not even aware that we're doing it <laughs> are you crazy yeah and then we got to that point where we thought we've overstayed our welcome this is just yeah. crazy I can't go on writing what I think is so when we finished they said to us I said look this is terrific because we want to write a sitcom mm. we want to do a thing with just the two of us in a room and what we want this is 19 2000 mm. what we want to do is write a sitcom in which two people you know grossly old fashioned all my references in comedy are old fashioned that's the difficult that's why I can never say I'm in the business the industry I know what's going on I'm at yeah. the cutting end I've never I've all the way through the cutting edge has sort of come gone changed yeah. and everything like that but as far as I'm concerned grossly old fashioned like Hancock really mm. two people you know who they are they're comedians but they sit in the room they talk mm. and you don't even know to begin with what the room is very much about yeah um, you just know that these are two blokes who are trying to do things and that's all that the whole thing resolves itself to at the end of the thing. Quite, I felt quite radical, you know, mm. but they didn't want radical. So they said, no, no, they had to do. So we decided in the end that they would have to be a couple of cartoonists because I'd met a couple of cartoonists and the relationship of the cartoonists was one spent their time writing the cartoon and cudgeled his brains all week to write the cartoons and the guy who drew it would come in and go and he'd walk out the door. And it would take him 10 minutes to draw what the other one had spent the week. I thought this is perfectly summed up, yeah. Mel and my relationship. Mm. So we did the first one, but it's not about drawing the cartoon. This is what we had to explain mm. to the... We had to explain over and over again to the BBC. It's not about the cartoons. It's not no. about their... We don't even know at the moment if they're married or who cares. It's like step to and son. They just happen to share an environment. You know, yeah. It's about the fact that the bloke comes in and, it, and while, they're, while they're trying to draw their cartoons, it's very cold in their office. Yeah, and yeah. and uh, that's because the heating's failed. So they argue with the owner of the, the office and then the man arrives and he's a plumber and he dies on the job mm. and Mel who has plenty is always doing this has invited all his mates around to watch football that afternoon in the office which Griff is furious about because yeah. they're supposed to be working and uh, and Mel wants the body moved of the dead plumber mm. before so that they can watch the football mm. but they can't get the body moved <laughs> uh, so they have to watch the football what with a dead body in the room yeah and uh, <laughs> uh, in the middle of the match just the, the final moment of the middle of the match the the uh, the relatives of the of the family arrive and they <laughs> just as they're trying to carry the body out of the room so that they can carry on watching because it's putting people off. Only they meet the relatives and they so they take him back in. Then the final scene is them watching, and this is where it all started. Because mm. when I watched, they think it's all over. The first night, they think it's all over. Mm. The first recording ever. All the writers who worked on that were standing in the writers in the room, watching. They think it's all over. Perhaps it wasn't. I think it was. They think it's all over. Or maybe it was never mind the buzzcocks, but watching football mm. at the same time because it was a very important match on. So they were watching it happen, but with one eye on a TV with the sound turned down. <laughs> and every time something happened, they'd go like this. It didn't matter what was happening in the show. Mm. They would, somebody would be aware that there was almost a goal. And 
I thought this, so we use this as the fine finale of them carrying the body out. As they're carrying the body out, they're sort of, they're all speaking pieties and looking at the television going, yeah, like mm-hmm. this in between thing. It was great. And we made the pilot and we presented it to the BBC and the controller said, and I remember saying to Peter, uh, we've made it and we watched it again. And they said, and he said, oh, we be no problem. It was just very funny. It's a very funny pilot, isn't it? I said, yeah. And he said, what else could they want? I mean, it's the two of you. It's very, very funny. And off we go. Mm-hmm. So, we go to see the controller, and he said, uh, no, this isn't for us. And I said, right. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, uh, uh, it's very male. And I said, <laughs> okay, yeah, it's quite male. Uh, I understand what you mean. Um, and I, when I thought about it, yes, it was very male. It was a very male-orientated thing. But I said, but, you know, but we are two mm. blokes. Yeah. And that's really what it's about, is two blokes sharing a room. Mm. An office, working it was before the office. It's a work environment, just two blokes showing a room and the sort of things they do to pass the time and so on. Mm. Mm. Yeah, but uh, can you... I think it's got to have uh, a woman in it. Okay. And I want it to be written by a woman. Okay. <laughs> That's really difficult because I'm a bloke and I write it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I wrote most of this sitcom, you know, with the guys with the guys who helped me. But, yeah. you know... And I don't see how it's feasible for me to to write it as a woman. You know, that's not a feasible yeah. thing for me to do. Yeah. Um, so, well, go away and try. So we rewrote it. And we spent, how long would you expect to rewrite a pilot? You know, I don't know, well, two uh, months? As another gender, a long yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we came yeah. back with a new script after three months. And when we presented that, they didn't read the script. They just said, well, the moment's passed. <laughs> so when you get that, go away and do more work. Yeah. and I've been in that situation ever since you know that uh, there's no point uh, when you go into a meeting and people are being respectful to you there's no point anymore because people if they're being respectful with you are not going to work with you they can be matey they can be abusive they can say why are you doing this you know what are you going to do for me but if they're respectful look out that's a very bad sign when you get to my age so how should they be acting if they're not being respectful? Because logically you'd want respect even if they want to work with you. No, no, no. What no, no. would you want then? No, no. Equal terms. Oh, okay. You don't want to be. You don't want people to be too respectful when they meet you. Come on in. How lovely to see you. Thank you for coming to see me. That sort of thing. That mm. crap is a very big giveaway. So I realised pretty quickly that whatever I did at the moment, whether we went to Channel Four, we took the pro. You know that that the process of being and actually, mm. I I think Mel wanted direct films and was shooting away to mm. do nothing and really not involved in I remember sitting with Mel actually mm. on a set and uh, we're sitting there and Mel said what the fuck am I doing this for and I said uh, how do you mean Mel yeah. <laughs> he said uh, well I should be I an edit now and I thought this is too much of a problem for me mm. you know that Mel isn't focused on this at all mm. doesn't want to do it anymore wants to be somewhere else and I don't want to be left <laughs> holding this this particular baby so mm. at that point I thought well I'll just I'll just retire, I'll just go away. I'll just give up. I, I made radio shows, and I made a very good radio show with Graham Garden, which we loved, mm. called Do Go On. That was fantastic. I really loved doing that. And then and after we'd done three series and won a Sony Award, the um, the uh, controller of uh, the commissioner of Radio 4 said, I think it's time to let somebody else have a go. Really? I think it was three series, two series. And at that point you go, oh, okay. We've won a Sony Award and we've just done something very funny, but it's time to let somebody else yeah. have a go. I've not had a go on Radio 4 since the 1970s, but mm. apparently. And um, I'm afraid I'm. Uh, I was at that age, which was. I was t- only 50 when I, I think about it now, where I thought, fuck this. And I got in a boat and sailed away. And I sailed as, got as far as Denmark. And uh, my agent rang up and said, oh, they want you to do a thing called restoration. So. I came back and did that. Oh, so and I've bad. been doing pretty much the same ever since. But if, it feels like those two points are the start of, you know, like BBC quotas, and a lot of people talk about sort of, uh, you know, sort of having demographics of what kind of shows they'll show and what kind of people they'll show. And it sounds like them saying something like, you know, oh, we want this written by a woman, oh, we want this uh, sort of, but you may maybe maybe step aside and let someone else have it, and, and they're sort of trying to... Would, would that not be, no? Uh, probably. Okay. Probably. But I, I, funny enough, I wasn't used to that. We'd spent... You have to understand that we came from into a period mm. where we were seen, with not an accurate news, as best left alone, 
mm. because uh, most of the staff, the people who were perfectly decent men, I now realise, mm. uh, we were arrogant and uh, <laughs> perfectly decent guys thought we had very good rapport with the controllers who love that stuff, but very, very dodgy sort of feeling from some of the um, people who ran Night Entertainment mm. who felt that we were into that was when before independent you know that was just mm. that was just within the just, department yeah, yeah. they were just newcomers you were young people who turned up in their 20s mm. we were like i was 26 turning up doing that show so and they decided to leave us to it mm. and exactly the same happened with smith and jones we did mm. for 13 years we never saw an executive just gone with it yeah yeah um, i don't think would you would you get that sort of freedom now do you no. think no no it's kind, yeah. it's kind of interesting how that's changed and yeah. how much it's more, uh, like you said, controlled yes. and, and, and much more... Uh, undoubtedly, yeah. 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 And, because uh, people who commission programmes think they're creative talents. What, what do you currently think of the state of sketch on TV? I think this, that uh, whatever you say, uh, whatever I was to say here, if I said There's, there will never be another great sitcom, there'll be another one tomorrow... Yeah. If you say, oh, uh, sketch comedy is completely dead and is useless and uh, compared with the golden days, uh, it, th- there'll be a great sketch comedy being done uh, within 20 seconds, which will take the world by storm. Um, I don't believe... Um, I think there are major changes in television. I think the whole mm. of Netflix and and, and yeah. the long-form, um, sort of uh, really expensively made drama like Breaking Bad, extraordinary. But even those, what happens uh, 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 is once somebody's made something which feels like both the first word and the last word there's a law of diminishing returns mm. it's particularly true that people who commission them start to think they know what makes things successful so they start to put restrictions and order things up when they don't know what makes things successful then the people who write or the talent often get a free range and make mm. something but that's often like shooting fish in a barrel they're, they're, mm. you've got to be allowed to make duds one of the problems <laughs> with comedy at the moment and is that many of the people who work in uh, the days of bill cotton are so so far away that bill cotton jr that you're just talking about a distant world that somebody who'd worked in comedy would be given control over the, because comedy is not made in the same way. Mm. They've got Dave. Yeah. And they have panel shows. Yeah. And they have things like Michael McIntyre's Big Show uh, and they have uh, Live at the Apollo. And so what they've done is effectively, rather than invest in the idea of creating their own show, which is always very expensive to do, sitcoms, they've sort of just bought in stuff that's already working from mm. outside, put it on. And that's at the moment. That that means that we're seeing a lot of stand up in various forms. We're mm. seeing it in panel shows, which mm. are at their best, like sitcoms. You know, you get to know the characters and you like their interaction. Mm. They're like two men in a room. <laughs> yeah. But what you don't what you don't want is a lot of sets and lots of people, and you have a a sort of aging audience watching network as well. Mm. So, television's format structures is changing, mm. but I don't think that means that there aren't people being funny i think yeah. that i think people are being incredibly funny mm. and and in different ways or different structures and formats mm. what i've the reason i've come i just went back because i wanted to do a show talking about mel I just wanted to talk about mel and while i was talking about mel the slapstick i thought oh i'll take this on the road and i intended to show that that pilot that mm. we made because i felt i'm going to take this pilot and show it to more people who would have ever watched it mm. on uh, a, a single showing on BBC Two, anyway, mm. I took it out and I showed it, and gradually I started talking more and more, and my show got longer and longer, and I started to cut down mm. the pilot to just some illustrative bits, yeah. and ended up with about five minutes yeah. of illustrative bits, and me just doing what essentially ended up more sort of stand up about being old and stuff like that. And then I did another show about travel, and I've just got back from Australia and New Zealand, and, and that was turning into stand up. I mean, when you're playing. 800 seater in, mm. in in whatever and you're going on you don't you don't you, they're anecdotes they're stories mm. and I, I I'd really have I genuinely said to the promoters I'm not I don't want any critics to see this I'm not coming into London I'm not taking mm. it to Edinburgh I'm not in competition mm. with this I'm just doing it for my own sake and discover something which I've never done which is stand up I've never I've never mm. just stood in front of an audience and I've learnt an incredible amount doing it over over the last two years I really enjoyed it and so mm. when I got back I 
slightly stupidly sent to a big charity gig uh, for which in in Ipswich just before Christmas and then took another job and so I came back from Australia just finished doing the show in New Zealand but I couldn't do the same material because this was a charity pe- set of uh, children's mm. hospice for the same audience that I'd done the mm. show that I'd been straight so I needed to write a new show between um, finishing in, I need to write a new show in four days and I did it <laughs> and I did uh, I did uh, an hour show in uh, Guildford mm. which was a little bit some of it was weak and then I did another hour show in Hebel Hempstead which was great mm. which was absolutely fantastic and then I did a blinder in in, uh, it's not really polished, but it's sort of like, it was great. And the feeling that you can go on stage if you can get an audience to sit there and you can take them in and you can tell them stories and you can be funny in those stories and you don't necessarily have to just, like, say, Tim Vine or, or mm. uh, Jack D, tell them jokes. Yeah. You can, or, or Jimmy Carr, you can actually sort of take them on the way with a story. Mm. Fascinates me. Mm. So that the spine of it is telling a real story and the observations that you make on the way are anecdotal, and it's more like uh, Richard Pryor or Bill Cosby. Do you know what I mean? Than 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 it is like a stand-up coming up with a series yeah. of one-liners. Um, is what I'd be interested in doing, and has given me something to do in my retirement. Do you, do you intend to try and build an audience, or do you just want to keep doing it because it's well, fun for you? Um, I, I said to Anthony, I said, "Is there going to be an audience?" For doing more of this you know in other words am i going to go out again and mm. try and go back to the same places um and find that gradually people go well i've seen him why bother to go and he said well that will that might that might happen but certainly not yet apparently most of these venues had said when's he coming back will he come and do some more so you go oh okay well yeah mm. yeah actually um and what's funny is we seem to talk hertfordshire mm. we seem to spend an awful lot of time in hertfordshire i must have done about sort of 10 venues in Hertfordshire it's unbelievable the number of venues in Milton Keynes and then you think Letchworth I mean these are not big mm. places they're only sort of 300 350 seaters mm. um, and uh, Tring and we had a fantastic night I had a, just a marvellous marvellous excellent funny night in Tring with a comedy audience that sort of appreciated you know where the where the mm. laughs were and things like that and I thought I thought after you know 25 years of <laughs> skin <laughs> comedy or however long I did from about I did from about 1970 to uh what moment to 2000 how long is that 30 years 30 years yeah yeah I never spent a year without trying to struggle with doing sketch comedy that's too mm. long that's too long yeah. and actually life isn't this is what this is why I say people say the business or the industry. Yeah. Life isn't about being in an industry or a business or anything like that. Life is about actually having some experiences. I got extremely happy doing sort of slow train through Africa or or uh, uh, rivers or something like that, where you actually were released from the obligation to be a twat in front of people, you know, or to mm. make them laugh for a while. But now yeah. I've just gone back and done two years of being funny in front of people. Yeah. And did the miser in the West End again, got back on stage again. I've got rather too many offers to be in yeah. plays again. Suddenly thinking, yes, I, I'd i forgotten how much I love being funny in front of an audience. Yeah. I'd just forgotten. A, a live audience, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and do, how do you rehearse an hour then? Because I, I assume you're not work in progressing these you're not going yes I do yes of, I do oh you are so you, oh, yeah. do you advertise it well, as well, a work in progress 100 people so I just go out so uh, the last tour I did 12 gigs around my house in Suffolk I just mm. went out and did lots and lots of little places and just mm. did it until I started telling and the, the difference was and the thing I loved about it the thing that made a difference to me it was I started in I'm a patron of a theatre in Bowness and I'd, I'd done a lot of work, a lot of writing, lots mm. of stories, lots of things, lots of things on the table, you know, far, mm. far more than I could ever use, sort of stories mm. remembering this and remembering that. And I did two two-hour shows, which were entirely different. So, but they're not rehearsed. They are sort of, I've got a list of stories I'm going to tell you. Yeah. And you go, I wish I'd never told you that story. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but this one is funny. And actually, look, here's an illustration of that when I'm falling off a cliff in whatever and so and that was and the second half of the 
second show I did, I started talking about colonialism in Africa. And I basically gave a lecture on how trains and uh, reflect the the military ambitions of the French and British. Um, and I don't think there were any laughs in it. <laughs> Afterwards, the owner of the theatre <laughs> came up to me and said, that was terrific. And I said, yeah, but it wasn't very funny the second half, was it? And he said, that didn't matter. It was just so interesting. Yeah. <laughs> the funny thing is that I'm less interested in the idea that you are totally funny all the time. I'm more interested in the idea of what have I actually got to say. Not that I'm saying anything significant. And I won't do it. I don't yeah. do. I'm not interested in commenting on Brexit or. No, you know, no, I totally. But, but on the other hand, I'm neither am I talking about my girlfriend flat sharing or uh, yeah. uh, or the effects of drinking. You know, I'm. So in other words, you know, there's a sort of level where my audience who tend to come mm. and I do a lot of jokes about talking to them, finding out how old they are and so on. It, it, it is not there to hear young people's comedy, comedy. about the difficulties of being 18. No. which most awful lot of stand-up comedy is mm. then another level of stand-up comedy is aren't kids funny and washing them seems strange yeah. and you know that's that's you're a young man now and you you're making jokes about not being 18 anymore well I don't even remember being 18 I don't even remember uh, uh, washing machines being strange yeah. but I do make jokes about what happens when you have a, a turn in Conran's or when you have a colonoscopy you know if you see what I mean. I do know. So yeah. I think there's a big market for doing jokes about how scared we all are of dying <laughs> by the time you get to 65. Yeah. And there's also, uh, like you said, it, it, it's because there's so much, like sort of, let's say, 20, 25-year-old people who are doing jokes for the young people yeah. that there's actually a, a, a gap now. Maybe. Exactly. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know Maybe. if there is. But I'm prepared to go out and say, you know, nobody <laughs> under 50 yeah. allowed to come to this show you know i'm absolutely <laughs> prepared to say look fuck you young don't people. bring your kids the whole don't thing about the show is yeah. say this is not don't bring the kids but don't yeah. bring people who've just got kids either this yeah. is for people who no longer have kids yeah 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 like this. well then they're going to be yeah. very old because of yes <laughs> well, <laughs> well, really I, does, I, yeah. I do just i say you know oh god you know my wife and i we've been trying for a grandchild and <laughs> <laughs> I like that. And I've got two kids, and they're both, you know, they were one's 31 and the other's 35, and we're both, rec- we're, you know, Joe and I reconciled to the fact that they, you know, they could leave home any minute. Yeah. So uh, that sort of joke with my audience. See, to me, that's they're about old people. That's just fact. <laughs> <laughs> they're old people jokes. And I think it's quite funny because I think there's a lot of, um, maybe there's a market out there. I don't know, except that it's very funny to be out there and honing and working your way through stories yeah. and jokes and, and doing it. And what, what overcame a nervousness for me because I used to be in a double act. So yeah, so you would have got quite nervous. Because so a double you act, yeah. you know, you 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 work together and you have to know what you're doing and mm. you can't go on unrehearsed. Although Mel did because he never wanted to rehearse. So you know, you had to sort of remember it. But Mel never wanted to sit down and work as a partnership. And that was a great <laughs> tragedy for in a funny way. Mel was a brilliant performer mm. and a very funny man, but. A lazy bastard. And so, you know, the sense of trying to get him to sort of work on stuff which w- might have made us brilliant was quite complicated. Mm. I remember He was a that'll do man. Yeah. I, I remember when I was uh, I interviewed Phil Jupiter for his podcast and one yeah. of the things he said was uh, after Buzzcocks, yeah. he sort of, you know, started going, g- gigging more than he was before. And uh, because of Buzzcocks and because he did Live at the Apollo, uh, sort of people just his age and a bit above who'd seen him for years came and saw him, but their kids came with. And he realised that for the kids, the joke is that's how funny dad would have been if he hadn't have got a corporate job <laughs> and for the dad it's look you this is what I could have been if I hadn't had you when I had the job and it's it's kind of it's it's weird to sort of think about your audience in those terms because well it's weird yeah. to discover your audience to, mm. to go out and and and, well, and it's weird to do had, this and this is what I really believe can I quickly ask did you even yeah. know you had an audience like did you have it did you know because you're working in telly and it's uh, so detached no, I don't really that. have a very big audience and I no. think to begin with quite a lot of the audience was, was some of the audience were totally amused I mean, I'd go out and play. I go and play audiences from old ladies who'd seen mm. me climbing mountains and being mm. nice about parts of Britain, and they weren't really prepared for me to come on. They were Yeah, yeah. They just didn't think 
you know. And mm. then in New Zealand, we had big audiences which remembered Smith and Jones fondly or mm. remembered. So, yeah, I mean, maybe there isn't an audience. Actually, when you say building an audience, yes, you've, you've made me think that that is something that I do genuinely want to do. Mm. I do genuinely want to see if I can get if people thinking again. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Griffiths can be pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, not just pompous. Uh, and not just point at things and say how beautiful, you know. Uh, there's a sort of, you know, there's a level of me that's going, okay, that's enough. That's enough doing that other stuff. I've got to stop and get back and you, be funny with an audience again. And and the miser was a big breakthrough for me. I mean, it was a very, a big thing for me. Um, because I don't think, <laughs> God bless him, I don't think even Sean, I don't think, mm. I don't think they, I don't think, I I had a career in when we were doing Smith and Jones, right the way through the 80s, doing comedy plays farces not 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 plays people say oh you did i did theater but theater at the very broadest level i mean the most sort of you know theatrical mm. level. uh trumpets and raspberries was an amazingly funny dario fo play to be in uh that's about the kidnapping of jenny and yelly and things like that but but uh but so was um uh, uh i had a huge hit with uh, charlie's aunt uh, and that was the funniest I've ever been on stage, I think. Uh, although Trumpets of Rise came pretty close. Uh, and then I did uh, Thark with Dinsdale Landon, which was uh, a, a farce. Uh, I was at the National with uh, uh, Wind of the Willows. And then I did Plunder, which was another farce, um, Ben Travis farce. And so, and I did, uh, with Pete Hall, I did uh, um, An Absent Turkey. These were all... 200 performances mm. they were all massive uh comedy plays they all mm. had a uh, huge uh comedy mm. on stage moments you know really mm. really big funnier than anything i've ever done in my life and mm. and then i stopped doing it and i was in the front page and i didn't get the, i didn't get the, i couldn't make the front page happen funny mm. enough i couldn't make my character happen in a way that i wanted it to it didn't it didn't develop into funny thing for me and I stopped doing that as well so apart from doing Fagin which I enjoyed doing in a musical I hadn't done take so for even the producers and the director it was a bit of a surprise to yeah. them <laughs> how funny I could be on stage mm. do you know from my yeah but when I'm in the miser yeah. I was pretty funny yeah what, mm. what's fascinating from my perspective is you were saying do it when you haven't got dependents do it when you're young do that all sort of stuff and I suppose uh, from an outsider point of view, looking at you and your yeah. career now, the, the the sale of Talkback obviously will have given you some some sort of cushion, and you've got your kids that have left home, and and you've got you've got time now where you where you've obviously got a job, and so you've got you know money coming in from travel shows and that sort of thing. So so you're able to go out and do stand up in a way that well, you know, do you know what uh, I mean? Like it's a different. Uh, I, 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 see, I assume those yeah, those things but allow you. It's so true to say that when you get to my age, it's a way of uh, making money. Mm to go out and entertain an audience mm. on a regular basis on a night mm. I don't play to a huge number but I go out they pay to see me mm. I say what I like mm. I don't have six or seven executive producers all fussing about mm. what is supposed to be in the show and what happens mm. I don't have to care about anybody if I want to go on <laughs> that night and start talking about as I often do something completely and utterly different from what I've ever spoken about before yeah. Yeah. And often I do spend quite a lot of time writing new material. And the first, when I arrived in Wales, got back to Wales, we we're, were in the Sherman Theatre there. We had a really great first night, a really great full house there mm. in the Sherman Theatre in Cardiff. And I go on and start talking about the fact that I was, my mother had always told me that, you know, or my godmother told me that I was being effectively, I was, I was conceived mm. at just where this theatre <laughs> <laughs> was built you know say for me it's sort of like tremendous coming home so here some people say I you know yeah. do local references and you're yeah, like, yeah. yeah you're doing literal yeah yeah, yeah yeah but literally i was able to and suddenly i looked out of the into the wings and i could see charlie my stage money going you know looking <laughs> at her watch because i'd done i'd done nearly 30 minutes of just being in wales type jokes yeah. of old stories things like that and hadn't really started the show which made the actual show rather perfunctory in a funny sort of way because it felt like an addendum to a, yeah. if, to a to a thing there wasn't enough time yeah. to do the rest of the show but that that freedom is unbelievably true and as long as there's an audience there and they've come mm. out and um this is the other thing it's not like did you die uh no i didn't die ever did i ever get to a point 
where I felt, yeah, I'm talking the audience isn't, uh, say, laughing uproariously. It's not going from joke to joke. But it doesn't matter because I'm telling stories anyway. I'm Can talking I, about yeah. what happened to me. And so, you know, we take the audience with us uh, and mm. there are great moments in it. And what I loved, uh, or what I liked, was was after having done over 100 shows, I think we did about 100 shows, going back and saying, um, okay, I'm going to start again. But I realised that what I need to do, go back to is that freedom to go, mm. I'm going to walk on stage here and I've got a few things written on the back of an envelope and a few things written down here. And maybe for 10 minutes, nothing really <laughs> Happen, but somewhere in these that's why I love trial things there's no there's nothing tryouts there's nothing mm. really riding on it and not having anything riding on it is is a new thing mm. for me because if you're with Mel and you're going live and you're going out and you're playing to 2,000 seaters you can't you can't just you can't go off no 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 you can't just go on and busk it um, but if you're playing to 100 people and you're going on and you're saying at the very beginning look Settle down, we'll just see what, what, what we've got here. Hang on, I've got something written down here which I wanted to talk about. First of all, let me, just before I start, who here has ever been? You know, and, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that way, um, it's about personality and it's about, and it's about suddenly discovering that there is something really, really funny in, in some telling a story about me uh, going for an operation on my back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, just, and just the surgeon casually sticking a swab in my arse crack <laughs> while he was getting ready to do this thing. And it's just the way that it develops I'm sure, I'm sure as a story. It, sure and you know, everybody knows this, but the great thing about being in front of an audience like that is some stories are, it's nothing to do particularly with the arse crack. It's the fact that he mm. he thought I was under general anaesthetic yeah. and so he didn't really he didn't really think about what he was doing. Yeah. And uh, But that that's not the point. It's just the idea that as you go on through, you suddenly yeah. find, as you do in any comedy thing, oh, they love this. People yeah. love this. They love this sort of stuff. And yeah. that's, I suppose, what we used to do in Footlights when yeah. we were doing the Evening Without. Yeah. People love this sort of stuff. Whether it's valid or that much more pertinent or what I should be talking about or what the newspapers would say. And so I don't want, as long as I don't have anything to do with that, I don't, I'm not here. That's why I don't want to go to Edinburgh. And they said, oh, you must come to Edinburgh. Grow. The show's ready to go to Edinburgh. I said, no, no, I don't really. There are 6,000 other comedians and there'll be loads of people saying, we must go and see if Griff Reese Jones is really, you know. And I don't want, I, that's not what I'm doing. When I was working with uh, Lee, and Lee said, you know, he's talking about going on tour, so I had to do this and do that. And he's got kids. Mm. And he's, you know, he's just moved house. And, he's, you know, and there's a sense that his family don't want him to go out on tour, do they? You know, and he has to go. And I remember that, that sort of feeling of, God, I'm working now and it's, you know, I'm leaving my wife dealing with all the problems and all that stuff. But my family want me... <laughs> Tell that, tell that story somewhere else. Tell could, could you, why don't you just go? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there's something very poignant I've never done sitting on a railway station at, you know, at 11 o'clock at night, you know, uh, waiting for that train, which is actually now not going to come until quarter to 12. And you've yeah. got three quarters of an hour in the freezing cold. So I've never done that. Yeah. And, and so all this is relatively new and hugely enjoyable for me and I don't mind at all I don't have any sense that I suppose which I imagine if I was sort of 30 or something like that and doing it to this sort of size audience sort of going I've got to I've got to get bigger I've got to do this I've, I must get on you know if I can are you reading of, my mind is that what it is? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's how I feel sometimes yeah of course I, yeah. yeah and then you maybe, venue, you go oh yeah. maybe next year I won't be in the studio I'll be in the big you know yeah yeah I don't yeah. funnily enough I don't particularly mind. I, it was great doing New Zealand where the audience mm -hmm. is built and so suddenly you know we were playing to 800 and I and so on and that was that was good and I thought and of course you think that this would be great if we could start playing to bigger houses and, mm. and you know that's fantastic and given what we've done given what mm. I've done uh, yeah I want to go out and say I suddenly realising how long ago things like those all that long run of West End shows was you get to a point mm. honestly where you don't even part, notice the passage of time you mm. go it's real shock to realise mm. it's 20 years mm. since we did, we finished Smith and Jones mm. 20 years ago that's long much much longer than we ever spent doing it but yeah. it's 20 years since I did the thing that really defined what I did mm. uh, and and that's weird it, it, what's your relationship like with social media then? Because I'm assuming... It no, 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 non-existent. Non-existent? Um, no. So but people don't tweet you after shows or come up... No, no, no. I, I only, I'm only on Instagram. I make a big joke about okay. that. But I don't I don't tweet. I don't really... 
you, what you, after a long time in the profession that I've been in, you get to the point where you don't want to hear. I was very interested. <laughs> I got that in, vibe with reviews when you were saying about reviews. Well, Rob Bryden was saying, you know, he said to me, I can't remember when it was. Where was I? And he said, oh, it's in the whole business. I should learn. Or maybe I was watching him or something. He said to me, you've got to learn not to go and look for your name and what people think of you mm. on her thing because oh, sometimes oh dear and I thought no no it's t- is it really taking you this long it can't have taken you this long Rob but you know you don't after a while you're you're in a safer mental state to not go and find out that some bastard has this to say about you mm. you know but why yeah. it doesn't if you're going out and entertaining an audience the audience come back and afterwards you meet lots of people who say we had a great night tonight you don't need any validation for to pick up and go and search around to find out whether everybody thought that yeah, yeah. or there are enough people who didn't think that or yeah. you know there'll or, be one person that didn't like it you know yeah yeah, yeah 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 and so funnily enough i've also got through that barrier of even though you know i've done i've done good things but i try not to even bother with reviews of things I've done where people say, oh, the reviews are fantastic. And I say, well, that's okay. Yeah. So it's you, you and your agent sort of have an agreement. He can read them, but you just don't touch them. Yeah, yeah, I don't. And I, I remember when I first worked with Felicity Kendall, who was, you know, long, long, many years ago, and she didn't read them either. I f- thought it was rather weird because I thought she was influenced by the fact that, that, that she... that She was influenced by the fact that she didn't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And it does itch like that. Yeah. That's it. Oh, I wonder if we've been a yeah, big yeah, hit yeah. here. So I just need from somebody like Joe, is it all right? Yes, mm. it's okay. Cool. And, yeah. and w- one question. And of course then I'll say, what do you mean okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't say that the way I no, like no, 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 no. Yeah. You mean okay, okay? Or yeah. okay, okay? Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Don't, I mean, what are we talking about? Okay for me? Or, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so yeah. all that stuff goes on. But, but yeah. uh, at the same time, I know from very, very bitter experience. And mm. I know that people very closely close friends you know you go i've had good reasonably good reviews i can get away with those we can get away with those yeah but if you read on Hmm. you will always find somebody who's and you always focus on the negative yeah Yeah. and i've also real uh, i got involved in an extraordinary um media storm uh, a little while ago about because the telegraph had done an interview with me and the sub-editors of the telegraph had taken a couple of phrases that i'd uh, said and constructed out of it another journalist a sort of thing that I apparently said that I was going to leave um, Britain if the Labour Party got in and you may find that I didn't, I didn't see okay, that well that's okay. great yeah. because it caused an absolute furor absolute extraordinary um, fuss mm. and there were demonstrations outside the House of Class War and things like that and and also the uh, according to Frank I'm not on I'm not on, on Twitter at all but it went you know crazy with uh, all we knew was that the the Guardian and various things had really given my address away and and uh, and all sorts of things that journalists are not supposed to do because I'd said this. I never said that at all. What I'd said was <laughs> what I said was I restored this place from basically a wreck and mm. turned it into a house. Mm. And if I wanted to do that again, mm. I would probably have to go to France to do it, to find a, you know, if I wanted to do it again, mm. which I would not want to do in no, any no, circumstances. No. But that was, uh, but I'd also, uh, but because I'd been saying that, having done that, with starting with a a, a, a wreck and turning to think that mm. the mansion tax was going to affect me in an extremely difficult way, but but that was not, mm. but that was just not something because I would probably have to sell. These things were conflated mm. into a sort yeah. of thing. But when it happened, everybody said to me, Griff, you've got to reply. You know, and I got bombarded by journalists saying, "Come and do the thing." And I said, "Well, actually, in a, in in all honesty, this thing will disappear if I completely and utterly ignore it, yeah. as if it never happened, mm. as if." And of course, that that may be seen as a sort of form of complete and utter cowardice. No, but no, it, no. But what was what was true was that as a result of not um, in any way acknowledging mm. the Funeral, or in any way joining in, it fizzled out almost immediately. And you, you also don't give it uh, credibility. Yeah. Because you ignore it. So you go through life and you realise that one of the problems that I've had all my life is I'm too bland for most news. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, because they don't. Well, because uh, newspapers and Twitter and social media thrive on something. Yeah, I get what you mean. Yeah. 
sort of uh, that that animal instinct of just like yeah. going for grabbing him. Yeah, you've got and, to be yeah, yeah. something. Yeah, yeah. You've got to have some skeleton in the cupboard or something to justify being. And if you don't, then that is that like like a uh, like a bully. Effectively, that really annoys them more than anything else. Mm. And so you discover that the threat to you through being bland is that somebody wants at some point to find something that excuses your blandness mm. because nobody can be yeah. that bland and so you know under those circumstances you live in a much more terrifying world mm. through being not um somebody who who rampages through the night every night you know you live yeah, in that yeah, yeah. you live on the edge of being somebody that's uh, yeah. that's suspicious for that reason <laughs> and so i don't know i find it quite complicated being that suspicious it's better keep a little keep bit, away then. yeah yeah I had one quick question about your about agents in general. Yeah. And I wondered what advice you would give to someone who is either looking for an agent or is trying to find the right agent. <laughs> I don't. You don't have anything? No, this is the, the honest truth. Everything was different for us. Okay? okay. Mel and I both had agents, and we didn't think that our agents really... I mean, both, both of us realised that our agents, decent people though they were, had no conception of the sort of success the normal line product use have been mm. um, because they came from a theatrical different world and like the, the world in those days it was just I can get you a, a small I might be able to get you a small part in something or other and you had to go mm. but not the product use has become a phenomenon you know mm. and they were not aware of it mm. so we decided uh, that the easiest way was to get our own manager and set up our own agency which we did so we set up our own agency mm. to kind of be, be, uh, that would be more in touch with your career yeah because it's because it's, and yeah. the idea was Pete Brown came into managers and we said to Pete well you'll run this and you run that and also you must build up an agency you know mm. you must build the reason we're going to have you is we're going to pay you enough money from us the mm. two of us for the income we're making for you to this is a good start for you you've got mm -hmm. two people you know who are pouring and you now set up an agency mm -hmm. and he employed Loretta and Loretta helped him and then in the end Pete was not up to it so Peter Finchman took that over and then uh, Melanie Sykes came in to help run it and she ran it and then Talkback was quite a big agency and used to run uh, you know used to have uh, Graham Norton and uh, uh, Angus Deaton things like that and uh, there were lots of other people as well and then it merged and became Troika mm. it went from Talkback after we but we sold mm. it on with the agency so I suppose we were arrogant enough in the early 80s to really genuinely believe we could do anything and that most especially at the edge of the business we were young and in that business were and i guess say you're making podcasts or you're involved in a new media which no agent whatever they say really understands or they you know then so it depends what you want to do because if you want to be put up for castings and things like that um, that's complicated then you need somebody who has that sort of access although all casting so I'm told these days are just pointing a camera at yourself pointing a, a phone at yourself and, and speaking down the phone I mean they don't ask me to do them I'm, no casting agency has ever or oh, casting director has ever come in search of me that's not the way I've worked I've just I've, I've, I've sort of been asked to be in plays by directors but I've never mm. been approached by it to be in any uh, TV drama or at least not for 30 years uh, so I know quite what's happened to me but that's mm. that's the way it goes yeah but there's no reason why somebody couldn't say well there are six of us they're all we're all in the comedy business why don't we why don't we have a mate to represent that's what Frankie Howard did mm. that's what Frankie Howard uh, De Dennis Norton uh, um, Spike Milligan Eric Sykes and they formed a sort of united artist, a writer, a performer, and, and Goldman Simpson did. Mm -hmm. And they employed Beryl Virtue. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, the, the, they may have may been badly. I can't remember the name of the... Um, yes. Yeah. Yes, I can't remember the yeah. name either. But yeah. Beryl Virtue and Frank... She's just a secretary from Caterham. And Beryl, <laughs> Beryl was the one who said, yes, I'll sit in the office, answer all the phone calls, and... Um, and handle your business for you. Mm. And by doing so, Beryl became a major, 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 major power in the land. Mm. <laughs> and that was true of Lou Grade and all that. So maybe, 
Hmm. The thing to do is to think very seriously. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> very, very seriously amongst you and your mates. And you must have got, you know, a group of you who sort of say, groups are not bad things, hmm. people, groups of people. Hmm. Because my big advice to anybody, if you're saying, if you can't get into a show, make your own show and do your own show in the back of a pub somewhere. And if you're really good, gradually, people will come and see it. And when they come to see it and you get a bit of a reputation because that show is the show, is the show the show that people go to, you know, eventually, maybe only one of you will triumph, but perhaps the person who puts it on or plays the piano will become a huge producer as a result of what, you, mm. <laughs> what you've done. So you might as well start your own agents. Mm. You might as well start your own business. You might as mm. well do that. What's complicated is that some people get snaffled up. They're so good. They get snaffled up by agents. Do you know what I mean? And then they can't, mm. then they're trapped, as it were, because the agent mm. is effectively running the career and often doing a very good job mm. for them but that's not the same as being like a chancer but if you're a chancer mm. why not mm. it depends what you do if you're creative if you're somebody who needs regular jobs and you need to be on the list of people who find regular jobs then you probably need somebody who knows about access to those regular jobs mm. but if you're somebody who's sort of pretty well making things up for yourself then you might as well form a consortium and and appoint somebody who's not doing very well or you're not making as much money to just sit in the corner and do that but again make sure that you don't mind doing it with a couple of tea chests and no pay until you make some money yeah that's great well i'm going to leave that there thank you you very much okay yeah thank you very much (laughs) that was griff hearing about how the old boys network began how he doesn't see himself as part of the industry um, but other people clearly do um, i feel uh, similar uh, intermittently when people sort of invite me to things as industry um, i don't find it frustrating but i do find it weird given i don't particularly think of myself as industry i think of myself as a comedian and a writer um but um it was good to hear that someone else uh, a lot more established than me clearly has a similar problem and doesn't like it either that's really lovely to hear from my perspective um i also adored hearing how he's trying to build a live audience for himself and touring later in life than most people do i i loved that it was amazing i mean obviously by the way obviously i know there are comedians around his age but i'm saying that most of them have been gigging for a lot longer than he has in in a live capacity. So how how inspiring, how wonderful, how amazing that you can start comedy at any time. You can make anything happen at any time in your life, and you definitely bloody should if you want to. Um, we've actually got a thing in our Facebook group, uh, which is... Um, stuff stuff I got off my arse and did which is an album where people have sent me in things they've started so like comedy nights or podcasts or any anything that you've started as a result of this podcast because it's shown you that it is possible anything's possible and you can do it send me in some more stuff we haven't actually added anything to that for a little while now so that'd be amazing if you've started comedy or you've done anything since you know listening to an episode or listening to a few episodes I'd love to hear from you and I think it would really help inspire the rest of the community I think that's the end of the podcast if you have enjoyed this episode you might also enjoy my interview of Ian Coyle, the TV commissioner at Dave, or with Mark Talbot, the head of comedy at Hattrick Productions, or with Chris Sussman, the head of BBC Studios. All of those episodes I adored putting together, and as someone who is intermittently involved with TV projects, I found them really interesting to hear more of behind the scenes from each of the different channels and or production companies, so please check those out and have a look. If you have enjoyed this episode and you want to support me, you can. You can do it by leaving us a rating on iTunes. We've got a couple of new reviews i'll quickly read them to you because I, I don't know i i heard on a, another podcast i'm reading out their reviews and i quite like that so let's i'm going to give a shout out to taffers 32 i don't know who that is because that's not an obvious enough screen name that i can track which comedian left it the strap line is so useful especially if you're new to the scene so i assume you're a new comedian hello Kaffers. loving working my way through these as a newbie to the scene there we go she's a newbie to the scene uh it is useful for comics knowing who's who what's what and how not to be a complete tool on the circuit thanks gaffers that is a bloody lovely review and i really appreciate it um got another one here from strawberry dan that is a great screen name but i i can't work out who you are some people have put their their name in their screen name strawberry dan unless that's your stage name in which i'm going to google that in a sec strawberry dan's strap line great insight his review reads uh really enjoyed the episode with binzi from hot water comedy in liverpool making my way through hearing these now top stuff would recommend to both comedians and promoters thank you strawberry dan that's very kind of you i really appreciate you taking the time to leave the review if you'd like to have your review read out leave a review i might read it out i might not i might make this a regular thing either way i just wanted to give back to people who have taken the time to do that 
that so please please take the time and do that yourself as well it is massively appreciated it really helps us get up the charts and looks better for future guests all that usual jazz so please do that and leave a review also things you can do is join the facebook group it's called rc industry podcast and it's on facebook obviously if you join the facebook group you can ask your questions to future guests and get the answers that you need to function within the industry and to just understand it a bit better so do join that that those things cost you nothing but less than a minute of time also if you would like to donate and keep this project going you can do it as a one-off on paypal.com using my website simonkane.co.uk or you can do it on patreon from one dollar an episode that's like 80p or maybe maybe less now that the pounds kind of plummeted would you like to support me would you be able to support me i think this is worth 80p actually i think it's worth more than that but if everyone who regularly listened to this gave me 80p it would be a break-even point podcast so i'd really appreciate it if you did that that would be absolutely amazing please do consider it i know it's a hard time of the year edinburgh around the corner if you're listening to it on the day of release but if you got a pound that you can throw my way every episode please do it takes you less than a minute to sign up to it and it makes a lot of difference to me so that would be amazing all the links to those are in the show notes the ask the industry podcast is a fruit that got in gravity's way production for the internet all elements were created by me comedian simon kane thank you very much for listening thank you very much for subscribing and thank you very much for rating and donating if you do i'll see you all in about 14 days time bye